Stop that. Stop that. Stop that. Yeah. I hear him chat to the noise. Move too quick, can't stop for the talking. I hear him chat with the talking. Just too sharp with the prize. White girls better tell me I'm awesome. Yeah. Hot like fire on the pan. If you wanna touch my please use caution. Hey, like zero degree. I'm Michael Cage, gotta let out the peace. Revolutionary guy, let out the streets. Locked in a cage, I'ma let out the let out the let out the let out the, let out the sheets. We can't go on, man. Forget my peace. We take the west side, take on the east. I'ma put him in a cage, never let out the let out the. Yeah, I hear him chat to the noise. Move too quick, can't stop for the talking. I hear him chat with the boys. Man, so tough, but man's keep walking. Yeah, just too sharp with the boys. My girls better tell me I'm awesome. Yeah, hot like fire on the pan. If you wanna touch my feet. Stop that! Stop that! Stop that! Halliburton Stugat has now gotten deeper in the Eastern Conference Finals than Joel Embiid <laughs> ever has. Uh, you have Funny. in Pascal Siakam someone who has twice now made it deeper into an Eastern Conference postseason than all of the process pieces. Mm -hmm. The Knicks, do you know how long their drought is without making an Eastern Conference Finals in relation to the rest of the league? Longest droughts without getting to a Conference Finals? It's got to be 90s, I want to say, I don't know, 30 years? It was the year 2000. They've got the third longest drought in the sport. It's only behind the Wizards and the Hornets, like huh. the real bottom of the barrel stuff and the loudest and biggest Nick season or the last two seasons, the loudest and biggest this century, eliminated by an eight, eliminated by a six, barely squeaked past a seven. Mm -hmm. Those are the two loudest seasons in the Knicks history this century. And good God, did ESPN soak that in bias. I don't blame Pacers fans for being an unholy kind of upset at how that became a celebration of the Knicks, even while the Pacers, Stugatz, are putting together through three quarters the best offensive performance that there's been in a Game 7 since 1963. Right. They miss no shots. Mm -hmm. How is that possible that the Pacers, is it just because the Knicks were injured? Is it just because the Knicks were playing a bunch of substitute players that shouldn't have been on the court that the Pacers were able to go through the entirety of that game missing like four or five shots when the game was being decided? I mean, the Knicks have been doing that the entire series. They've been short. Their bench has been shortened. Randall's been hurt, and they played fine. They made it to a game seven on their home court. Uh, the Pacers had a great night. I mean, that's it. They, the Pacers had a great shooting night, a legendary shooting night, the greatest shooting night in the history of the NBA playoffs. There's not much you could do about it when you consider the fact that they had that night and the Knicks are depleted. They just are. I mean, everyone's hurt. Now, listen, it was a great season for the Knicks, and I'm tired of people making fun of the fans. Like, the fans got caught up in a great moment. There were great moments throughout this playoff run, if you want to call it a playoff run, into the Eastern Conference semifinals. But enough knocking Nick fans, okay? They were loud. They were boisterous. Why? We haven't been there in a while. And because Jalen Brunson provided us with some of the greatest moments in NBA playoff history. He did. <laughs> I mean, for us, <laughs> for us, <laughs> for us, uh, I deserve it. What happened to the Mecca being hard to play in and you don't want to play in there in a game seven and the six seed? This is why you don't want game seven, Dan. Scared. Right. Well, if you have confidence in your team and you're better than the other team, you should want game seven. Awful we take. We had, we had no confidence in our team. What we had confidence in was the Mecca, was the fans, was that building. There is food flying out of my mouth right now. This fear, Dana. What happened to the Mecca being a hard place to play? And it is a hard place to play. It wasn't yesterday. I mean. Well, it's a pretty good time for it to be a hard place to play. <laughs> yes. That would have been a good time to summon whatever that is. The Mecca choked, Dan. I mean, yep. it was awfully quiet is mm. all I'm saying. Yeah. I, when I'm hearing Isaiah Jackson miss a free throw so that the Pacers can merely be up 19 and everyone's really happy that the Pacers have missed a free throw, they got to within five. Oh, that run, though. <laughs> that building was rocking. That was the Mecca. 
Paulie the Knicks to within six, I think, at one point. But what the third happened quarter. then? But what happened? Mecca got that? tired, Dan. Yeah, did they? Yeah. <laughs> well, I did feel bad for Brunson. They were picking him up full court, and the intent throughout was just to bury him in fatigue. I thought Stu got something interesting last night. Obviously, you can't go wrong if you're a coach and you play Jokic all the minutes. But he was exhausted. And the reason they got all those rebounds and all those offensive rebounds, I mean, they might have gotten him if he wasn't exhausted. He was exhausted because he was playing all the minutes, and guys that size don't play all the minutes. And at the end of the game, when that game was being decided, you saw the Timberwolves go up 12-2 because they kept getting second chances because Jokic couldn't keep all those giants. They look awfully small when Jokic is tired when yes. Jokic is is fatigued all of a sudden you're looking around hey where's their power forward like where where's somebody gonna, where's Aaron Gordon where's somebody yes. who's gonna grab it where's Michael Porter I, where's someone who's gonna grab a rebound given the nature of how he shoots the ball I thought it would be very difficult to tell whether or not Jokic has his legs under him because he never gets lift anyways but by the end they were pretty tired shots and watching Jokic very closely last year really for the first time I noticed man five minutes into this game Jokic looks tired and then his secret to the game was he would just maintain that level of fatigue the entire time he always looks tired no but he always looks like kind of tired <laughs> but he never crosses the threshold last night we crossed the threshold Dude looked gassed in ways that I've never seen before. This is what I will tell you, though, as people talk about, is Anthony Edwards the face of the league and what happens to another one-time champion? Stugatz, not enough people are going to talk about the decision to play Jokic all of the minutes, and in the fourth quarter, Minnesota rebounded 70% of its misses. Yeah. Like, when they come back from 20 and Denver can't score – because Denver being in that series, Stugatz, because of the Minnesota defense, the 30th ranked offense, if we put what they did in this series in the regular season, they would have been one of the worst offenses in the league. They don't do well when they score fewer than 100 points. How is it that we don't get more expertise in the coverage that focuses on defense while we obsess about offense all of the time, Stugatz? Who wants to focus on defense then? Honestly. Well, that's the reason Minnesota right. won, though. Mm -hmm. Like, you might not want to focus on it. You can focus on all the other reasons that you think they won, but the reason they won is because they wore the hell out of Jokic uh, with their big people, just like Juju said. I assume that's why Juju's dancing. Juju, don't throw your hands up as if you haven't been dancing for seven minutes. I mean, Dan, I'm just you're a humble participant here, guys. I'm just happy to yeah, be alive. Sure, you are. I mean, you're making a great point. The Nuggets had 37 points in the second half. I think about that. 37 points in the second half. Well, I want to ask you something about how the sport is changing because I will say to you, get used to the idea that a team will come back from 15 down in a game seven. That's the first time that that's happened. It's the first time it's happened on the road, but get used to that. Once the three-pointer becomes that kind of important, you're going to get these wild shifts in scores because it didn't mean much that Denver was up 58-38 in the first half. It didn't mean much that Barkley and others were saying, get Gobert off the court because he can't do anything to defend Jokic. But clearly, them throwing Reed, Carl Anthony Towns, and Gobert at Jokic uh, presents a set of problems that no one else in the league can present for Denver. Nobody makes Denver look like that. Miami with Bam Adebayo did some of that last year and didn't have the offense to overcome it and lost in five games. That's not something that you see from a championship-level offense. And the thing that I wanted to ask you that's also changing now, the era of the super team was great for the winning of championships. But now, in a sport that is traditionally super predictable, you have a five, a six, a three and a one, and you're going to have your sixth champion in six years. And each time they win the championship, they tend to break apart, too. Toronto is in no way in any realm what they were with Kawhi Leonard and Siakam. And I always heard that dynasties were seen as bad for the sport, but I don't think that this is better. 
I like it. I wouldn't have liked Jokic winning three or four straight titles. I don't think that would have been fun for anybody. I think it would have felt a little bit like San Antonio winning the titles where people, you know. Boring. Lil Wayne can't even explain. He's just, I don't like Jokic's game. I just don't I don't like watching any of that. I, that's not for me. That that ex- unstoppable excellence, that's not how that's not how I want basketball to look. Is six champions in 6 years good for the sport? Well, the ratings would indicate no. Uh, I know that they're in a different place, but sports across the border are up and the NBA is struggling. Some of that's due to the sport changing, but the the poison that met the, the super teams such as the, the Miami Heat and the Golden State Warriors kind of scared players away from it. It scared Kevin Durant away from winning other titles because he wanted to do his own thing, and not a lot of people are comfortable being the bad guy. I don't think this is great in a vacuum when you had the Spurs having their run, Lakers mixed in there, the Heat dating back to the Rockets and, and, and Bulls. You always long for a day where there was a little bit more parity in the sport, and now that we have it, I'm not sure I love it. You guys sound like losers. <laughs> <laughs> I am one. I mean, <laughs> Jokic had four rebounds in the second half. Four in the second half. And they just came at him with wave after wave of just giant bodies. I understand what you're saying. He was, listen, he was tired. They wore him down. They have three guys they could throw at him. He did have 34 points and 19 rebounds no, understood. in a game seven. I know, but Stugatz, their <laughs> offense was bad. I know. And it doesn't matter if you're getting to 90 points against the number one defense in the sport. You're going to give up the 20-point lead. You allowed way too many second-chance shots. And Denver's championship was over the moment that Rudy Gobert hit that turnaround jumper. There we are. The I am going to tell my grandchildren's children about the night. Rudy Gobert shot a ball into the heavens, and it came down not touching an net. It was unbelievable. <laughs> it's the way. It's the way. I did not have Jokic being slain that way. Of all the, If you could have predicted for me all the ways, if you had come to me, I don't know, 24 months ago and said, look, this is what's going to happen. This guy who gets, <laughs> keeps getting played off the court because he no longer fits. He's a dinosaur trying to fight against fighter jets. It doesn't fit on the court the way the sport is changing. But this is what's going to happen in a couple of years. Jokic, who's the three-time MVP, is going to put down his sword because Rudy Gobert's hitting a turnaround jumper that he's floating higher than the shot clock because he's panicked and there's nowhere else to put the ball except throw it toward the basket because the shot clock is expiring. Enjoy your horses. <laughs> I, 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 but you tell me, if you're Jokic in that game. Evil just, voice. Just, yeah, but think about this, though. You're exhausted. You're sitting here saying, oh, really? Again with the sixth man of the year with a putback. Again with Carl. But I've kept Gobert out of here, and now it's Carl Anthony Towns who's going to have the putback. You're exhausted. You want to go see your horses. It's been two long years. And then that shot goes in. You're like, I'm going to keep running up and down the court, but I'm thinking of vacation now. <laughs> I'm, I'll keep going. I'll keep trying. Going through the motions. I, I will physically <laughs> go through the motions. You will see me motioning as if my season is not over. But once that falls from the sky, you've got to be like, okay, I, th- th- this is meant for me. I am destined it's not in the cards, to Dan just yeah. go rest somewhere <laughs> for the remainder of the season. But getting back to uh, Stugatz's beloved uh, New York Knicks, uh, they wasted the Burks game. They did. I oh, told wait. you, 20 yes. points any given night. Hey, Stugatz was right. Thank you. Holy <laughs> Stugatz was right. <laughs> Stugatz was also right to uh, feel down, even though he was up 3 2. <laughs> Stugatz was right. Holy <laughs> Stugatz was right. The thing that's crushing is to have the expectation of this is going to be the most electric building we've had this century, and then nothing all game long. Yeah. Pushed, pushed back again and again by. Miles Turner. By shooting. 
<laughs> whoever that was on the front row, they did this. Oh to, uh, to whoever Ty, uh, Tyrese Halliburton was talking to, I didn't know if it was Sam Morrow. I don't know who is, but that person is responsible for the Knicks' demise. I'm saying it on wax. I mean, all those funny people from New York we brought through this show and to all be undone by Andrew Nempard. <laughs> right. I hope we got Mero, Sam Morrow, everybody on here today, right? Sam Morrell is yes! going to be on here in a little while. Yes. I, I'd like to uh, circle back, though, on East Coast bias, Dugatsa. And I've been talking about this for a while because one of the places that I saw this change was on Pardon the Interruption, where I see Michael Wilbon tucking his Cubs jersey into his jeans and going out there and throwing a first pitch. And I was like, oh, okay, we're doing the – Sports journalists are allowed to have allegiances thing. That's the day journalism died, Dana. It is. Yeah. Put it on the poll, Juju, at Levitard Show. Uh, when Wilbon threw out the first <laughs> pitch at a Cubs game, is that the day journalism died? But yesterday uh, on the show, and I'm not going to go back into the well that I've gone into very often that gets people upset about how the power shift has changed at ESPN, but at least in part, because Stephen A. Smith yep. is a very public Knicks fan, mm -hmm. the coverage of that game beforehand, Stugatz, yep. was Spike Lee and motivational speech from Stephen A. Smith is a Knicks fan, and it was very celebrating all things New York the same way that the big networks celebrate the Cowboys and the things that get ratings. But to me, if I'm a Pacers fan, the part that pisses me off is the last four minutes – of that game, a historic game for the Pacers, only Breen every once in a while would bring it back to the Pacers. It was the Knicks that they were talking about the whole time. And if I were a Pacer fan, I'd be mad at how slanted that coverage was. But Pacer fans won the series. They're moving on to the Eastern Conference Finals. They have the last laugh. Who cares Stugatz, about that you stuff? Say, Stugatz, no, Dan, the story Stugatz. yesterday, win or lose, was about the Knicks. It was about those fans. It was about that building. That was the Stugatz. story headed into the game. The story changed once the game got started. But before the game, what do you want ESPN to cover? The Pacers? Stugatz, when you say, who cares? Sports fans care about perceived disrespect. And this was disrespectful. Like, I'm not a fan of either of the teams I'm watching. I see one winning, the other losing, and the one that's being talked about is the losers, as if they're the winners when they shit the bet at home, although there were valid reasons. I uh, saw it on Awful Announcing. Bob Myers was asked at halftime, what are you seeing from this Pacer team of, to, to come out so electrified in that first half, and he immediately talks about OG Ananobi, and, and it, it becomes a soliloquy about the New York Knicks, even though he was asked directly about what he's seeing from the Pacers. You tell me how I'm supposed to feel if I'm a Pacers fan, and this is the third different roster that's made it to the Eastern Conference Finals, and you're still talking to me about the Knicks, who have the longest drought outside of the Wizards and it, Hornets. I, I get it, though. That like we, We've detailed the, the struggles and ratings from where they used to be. One thing that definitely rates for the NBA is the New York Knicks, and ESPN now is a propaganda machine for the broadcast that they own the rights to. And what is getting people in? They see the metrics. Why do you? What? I guarantee you they're going to talk Dallas Cowboys today on first take. Because they have the metrics to support. They need to be talking Dallas Cowboys every day. Mike, fast forward to the Eastern Conference Finals. The story is going to be about the Celtics. Win or lose, it's going to be about Boston. Dan, no one cares what anyone in Evansville thinks about the coverage, okay? No one does, okay? Gary, Indiana, Fort Wayne, Indiana, please, okay? Nobody cares what those people think about the coverage. They are moving on to the Eastern Conference Finals. That's it. That's enough for them. ESPN did the right thing. They cover the right team, the right city, because that was the story headed into the game. I would dispute that on a couple of different fronts on behalf of Indiana fans. One of them would be this. The Knicks had two turnovers, two turnovers, while getting slaughtered in that first half. The Pacers got one free throw. 
like midway through the second quarter, one free throw. Do you know how hard it is to win on the road <laughs> under those circumstances by blowout? <laughs> it's not that the Knicks played poorly. It's just they endured a historic onslaught that was being ignored because we were talking about how injured the Knicks were and how bad you felt that now Jalen Brunson is out with a fractured hand. You mentioned the East Coast bias, and I think we have a Sunday night bias in that that what happened on Saturday in that sport was also really rad. Uh, Kyrie Irving is now 14-0 and in closeout games, and that game looked over, and they come all the way back, and Luka Doncic appears to be the kind of irresistible force with a triple-double that maybe Jokic was last year, and for me, that is the story. I mean, Luka Doncic getting emotional talking about Kyrie Irving, who very quietly has become a leader on that team, has fit in nicely, has not at all been a distraction, has been that piece, and is now fulfilling the promise. It's crazy. He's doing for the Mavs what he was supposed to do for the Boston Celtics. There are two bits of analysis that everybody whiffed on in the new NBA. It was the Gobert trade that everyone got wrong and the idea that uh, Dallas wasn't a good fit for Kyrie Irving. You mentioned OKC, you know, Oklahoma City, Oklahoma City, and now your hearts are Oklahoma City. They bars. Wow. Wow. They, wow. they ha- coming soon. That was good. They had at 1 a.m. a bunch of fans at the airport like it's a college town. And when you say who cares, Stugat? Right. That's who cares. OK, great. Okay, but I'm you, talking about but, Terry but, Hot, Indiana. But I you mean. don't care that way anymore, and you would care. I, you would care that way if you'd won. Listen, you I've never, I've never cared enough to meet my team at the airport after they've lost. Actually, I've never cared enough to meet my team at the airport after they've won. You're not uh, emblematic, uh, Dan. Here. I, 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 people who show up to the airport late at night to applaud their team coming off a plane because they had a good season. It's weird. Please, it's sad. Yeah. Don't do this, brothers. Y'all teams are losers. That's it. Don't lash out. <laughs> Y'all are at home. That is all that's happening here. It's a fair criticism to bring up the lack of Pacers coverage, but this show doing it is oh, like we covered the Knicks more than anyone during oh, the guiltiest party. Minute. Guiltiest party. Oh, Absolutely. W-F-A-T, Absolutely. Mean. We are the guiltiest party, and hypocrisy is looking at me in the mirror, but I will say yeah. it was only to get to today. <laughs> understand that. And it, audience acquisition. Uh, uh, no, understand that I knew today was coming at some point this season. You knew you were getting there. I knew I was going to get there somehow. I was going to get this day. Damn you. There was no chance. All the other teams could be as injured as the Knicks, and the Knicks were not going to have a day where I was going to eat it at the end. That's not what was going to happen. The whole of that was strategic. We turned into WFAT. We got bloated. WFAT! Speaking of WFAT, WFAT t-shirts are right now available on levitaraf.com. Go get you seven of them. WFAT! Fire Tom Thibodeau, trade OG, get rid of him, don't re-sign him. Hartenstein as well. Just light up the phone lines today, boys, and enjoy your 20 share. (laughs) You will uh, be able to talk. Uh, I'm a little scared at what's going to happen live with uh, Sam Morrell because he's not going to be happy. He's going to be running dark, but he's going to give, I'm imagining, because he's positivity guy about this team I'm assuming that what he's going to do is just be proud of that team's heart and fight which it was overmanned outmanned it was not healthy enough but I thought the home stadium was supposed to get you a game. Yeah. I thought it was supposed to get you an important game. It got game. us game five. Those are, I, mean. I mean, they have very valid injury concerns, and they probably would have been smoked by, by Boston, who I think we can now look at it. What a flat track they have right? yes. to get back to the NBA Finals. Whoa. They have to win it, right? They, they've got to beat the Pacers gotta... without Porzingis, and without Porzingis, Mike, you laugh, but without Porzingis, they're a small team, they're a different team, they're uh, a bit positionless. What, what I'm laughing is I'm, I'm I'm remembering the the YouTube cold open where Sugats was formulating this all the pressures on the Timberwolves uh, take. <laughs> right. yeah. What are you talking about? Whoa. If Tatum doesn't do it now, oh, right? Like if he doesn't do it this if time, not now, when? we yeah. better crush him. I'm talking LeBron 2010. <laughs> Crush him. <laughs> I want a Tatum Edwards final so I can crush somebody. 
I mean, that's what I'm looking for. I want to crush, I crush I wanna, on Dallas. I want to crush the Knicks doctors for doing that to Ananobi for that result. <laughs> that guy's not going to be able to see straight for several months because he played those minutes trying to get that Willis Reed moment. <laughs> How do you waste the Willis Reed moment? <laughs> I don't believe, in all honesty, Stugatz, that you can have something happen to your team when you're going in with the expectation of the Mecca will win us one, it's a game seven, the Mecca will carry us even <laughs> though we're undermanned. I don't think there's something that can neutralize that more than me saying this sentence. The Pacers had more points through three quarters than any team since the 1963 Celtics. Amazing. The the idea that you Amazing. think your home crowd, that you would be motivated by the epic fart after Game 5 and that you would literally run out of gas right. in Game 7 yep. and get run over by the Pacers putting together a historic shooting performance. What happened between game one and the rest of the games to Halliburton? Because I didn't want to object to the expertise of Steven Jackson and Matt Barnes when they said he's not a number one. But when he was healthy this year, he looked to me like a number one. He looked to me like someone who could shoot from anywhere on the court, even though he's a distributor. And I'm not sure going forward if I'm willing to say that Halliburton's not going to keep getting better given that he tried to come back early for from injury just so that he can hit that performance bonus that he has if he's all NBA. If you're all NBA and you're the lead player on a team, yep. like the Pacers, a team that's in the Eastern Conference Finals, you're a number one. You think he is a number one or can be a number one? I'm, I'm saying that I would he like the, that. He is the well, he's number a number one, right one on now. that team. Yeah. I would like that at the top of my team if they're going to play that way. If the way they're going to play is be the most uh, the, the most explosive offense. For a game, Dan. But he's, it's not for he's a game. A really... it's, Stugatz, it's been all season. Their offense has been extraordinary. No, I understand that. But what they did in game, even with that said, what they did in game seven was historical. It was but amazing. Stugatz, Halliburton's younger than the entire I Knicks know. core. I know. He's a really fun player to watch catch fire because of the nature of his shooting form. When he starts feeling it and it just bombs away with such a high arch on it, it's baffling. it is really fun to see. It's uh, it's one of the many evolutions in the sport that continues to confuse me. How it's a good shot for a guy to roll to his left on the three-point line and right. just throw up some Gobert bull that just sky rains, raindrop, and then it's in the basket. And you're like, what the hell is that? But you ask, how could he be, or is he a number one? Or you think he's a number one? Dan, he had games where he had eight points, 13 points, 15 the, points. The only reason I don't think he's a number one is just because the top 12 number ones are so good that they make it so that we're spoiled that that guy's range, because Stugatz, the sport has changed. Yep. To have that kind of range is an uncommon value. And so he might score differently than others. And, by the way, he's he loves assists. But yeah. he is the centerpiece of why it is that offense does uh, does what it does. But they also traded for Siakam because they knew that he, he needed somebody next to him that Brunson doesn't have. You mentioned Siakam, and I'm uh, recalling what you did at the start of the show where you mentioned Tyrese Halliburton made it to a conference finals before Joel Embiid. I got this from a Joel uh, from a Pascal Siakam stain account. It's uh, Siakam Spin D2. Embiid was drafted in 2014. Pascal Siakam was studying to be a priest in 2012. Found basketball, got drafted in 2016. Won a G League Finals MVP, was a role player, won most improved, made his first conference finals, won a championship, made an all-star and all NBA teams, got traded, turned 30, and made another conference finals all before Embiid went to his very first conference final <laughs> it's a bit crazy to say uh and at no point with the expectations of being a number one always being a number two for pressure purposes unlike Embiid who is the only thing in the last two years to unravel at the feet of the Knicks that way to see the the Sixers 
not advance into these Eastern Conference finals when if I put that Sixers roster next to that Pacers roster and I'm giving you a coach in the Pacers to gods who hadn't won a playoff series since 2011. Right. That style of play. <laughs> I, I understand that you're making fun of Gary, Indiana. I'm not making fun of them. I'm just right. saying some, don't object to the coverage. You some won. gangsters in Gary, right. though, big brother. I'm going to just warn you. It's some oh, gangsters in Gary and no. Michael Jackson from right. Gary. I, know. I would not uh, be doing what Stugatz is doing for a number of reasons, but one of them is why wouldn't you want to have the style of play the Pacers play? I would love to have the style of play of, of my team. In fact, I'm, I'm willing to say that that style of play just aesthetically – Give me a six seed that plays that way instead of a two seed, just for my team that plays like the Knicks. If I know that neither of them are going to have a chance, but one of them's going to have a chance if they make all of their threes on a given night. The Pacers during the regular season this year in the Eastern Conference had the highest frequency of open shots and the best effective field goal percentage on those open shots. And that's what you saw in the first quarter last night when they ran the Knicks out of the building. They had 39 points in the first quarter without taking a free throw. That's how open they were for all of these shots. I love watching them play basketball. It's confusing to me to watch them play playoff basketball, especially in that building, because what I'm used to in that building is the score 78-75, and Anthony Carter has to make a shot uh, that goes in from behind the backboard because because everything has been uh, dragged uh, totally into the mud and they're just going up and down the court uh, at, at turbo speed and doing a bunch of things near the rim. Wait, so you're excited for the next series? You wanted Pacers and Celtics. I, I you did would not I, want. You, you if did... you give me a choice, excuse me, Stugatz. Right. I'm sorry, but I would have liked right. just to see what Atlanta and Indiana could do against Boston because give me the games in the 120s and the 130s and the 140s. Don't drag it into the mud. We haven't mentioned the secret weapon, the most powerful weapon in Indiana, Timothy John McConnell. Enough of him. When he starts pumping up the crowd, it's when he makes his – all of his points are loud as hell. His rebounds is loud. His charges he takes is loud. Salute to Timothy for keeping them boys in line. TJ McConnell, uh, if I was playing against it, he did this to the Heat in a game they needed uh, late in the regular season. He's exasperating to play against because it's Arnold from accounting uh, taking off his tie, getting on the court. How tall is TJ McConnell? Because he's taller than he looks, but he's not very tall because everybody on that court is taller than you think they are. He's six one. You're saying he's a tall six one. I'm saying that next to you, he would look very <laughs> tall on that court. He does not look very tall. He'd be taller than most of the people who work on our show. The, the majority of people right. on our show are not as tall as tiny T.J. McConnell. T.J. McConnell's 32 years old. Wow. His teeth are, tw like, 10 months. <laughs> He's got a perfect haircut at all times. It looks like he just stepped out of the shower. And I don't understand. Or under the dentist office. I don't understand how everybody isn't blocking his shot. <laughs> how all of those mid range jumpers are going in because that is a lifetime of survival of the fittest. That guy has learned how to shoot over the outstretched fingers of someone taller than him since he was a toddler. <laughs> that guy's been working on that for the last 30 years. The, the hands near him don't bother him. And it is exasperating to try and play defense against him because what's he doing? Oh, he's in the key again. There's another eight-footer from T.J. McConnell. I've, I've, guarded every, I've guarded all the other people who look like basketball players on the court, but the guy who's an architect got me with a mid-range jumper. And I'm exasperated. How did we feel about celebrity sadness yesterday? Uh, uh, photos of Spike Lee. Uh, they, they got Ben Stiller at one time Man. picking at his nose uh, yeah. in an embarrassing moment. Uh, Chris Cody, who who did you see out there that uh, that gave you a feeling as a Heat fan of the only good feeling left for Heat fans? It's rooting against other people to lose. It was between sad Spike Lee with his like hands under his chin, or it was John Stewart just looking like he was about to cry. <laughs> John, John Starks trying to be the official a few times in the game was also funny, trying to make calls that were clearly wrong. <laughs> Their alumni <laughs> row is really funny. Yeah. Just because it's a bunch of guys that didn't do it either. Marcus Canby. <laughs> Correct. Yes. But they went to the finals. And... I saw Marcus Canby described as Nick's legend, and I was like, ooh, 
I mean, I mean, it's all we got. Legend, think, legend is doing so. a lot of work there. I think so. Put though. it on the poll. Juju. Those losers on the screen. <laughs> Put it on the poll, Juju, at Levitard Show. Is Marcus Canby a Knicks legend? Yes <laughs> or no? Because I really do feel like we're diluting uh, what the word legend means. The you most know? legendary thing, salute to Marcus Canby. I'm a big Marcus Canby fan. But this has just outgrown everything. The meme with him doing yeah. this. Yep. Yeah. Mm-hmm. <laughs> the Camby man. <laughs> it, that became like a heat Twitter yeah. rallying cry, the Camby thing. Speaking of the heat, and Dan mentioned that heat fans are rooting for other teams to lose, Indiana and the Celtics, Mike, because you have a history with both those teams. Who would you rather see advance here? Oh, the Indiana. Yeah, Indiana. Yeah. I think it would be really funny if Boston fails again, and I'm not going to let Mike Schur do what he did in his last appearance, which, which was oh. try to couch that making it to the finals would be good enough. No, this this franchise has only won one title while I've been alive. they got to do it. <laughs> not only see it. Not only won one title, right, Stugatz, uh This is not unlike what the Cowboys get in football, where they get all of the great broadcasting jobs because of the – star on the helmet even though it didn't produce very many titles after right. any titles yes. after Troy Aikman the people who have eaten off of that one title whether it's Kendrick Perkins or Doc Rivers when you can make the argument that the one title the Celtics have won this year represents or this uh, century represents uh, an underachievement from what is supposed to be our most historic franchise. There are a lot of people who've gotten good jobs off of the one title that uh, they've won and gotten media careers because uh, they basically won as much as Kawhi Leonard won the one time, as one as uh, as much as Jokic has won the one time. Uh, it's it's pretty impressive to see the amount of work that Doc Rivers gets uh, despite all the other failure well, around the one title. He's got seven good jobs off of that title. Yeah, I got to say, mean, watching seriously. the Pacers, nothing really bothers me because all those players came in came and went I don't the Heat don't have a rivalry with Halliburton maybe a little bit with Miles Turner but I will say when I see Carlisle on on the sideline that that does kind of irk me yeah Yeah. do you realize Stugat that if the Mavs win the highest seed the Celtics would have seen would have been the Cavs if the Mavs, if the Mavs funny. win that series, yep. I, I don't know because, like I've said, it has been until the recent changes to the sport a very predictable sport. But five, six, three, and a one as seeds, I don't remember the last time I saw that. And while I think the Celtics have been overwhelmingly better than everyone all year, not without Porzingis. They really need Porzingis in order to win the championship. This is a dangerous proposition. Uh, Sam Morrell cannot be happy right Oof. now. He is, he is uh, uh, proud, proud of his team, but uh, he runs dark, and the last time we had him on after a loss, it was just simply dangerous. And he's got a sly smile on his face, and I've got to be honest, I, <laughs> I get scared when he's got a sly smile on his face because what can come from behind that mask is dangerous, and it is professional, and it can be funny and sharp, but it can also be uh, violent. Violent and unpleasant, and he'll burn everything here down. He doesn't care because he is uh, hurt today, I imagine, but proud of his team. He's our senior Knicks correspondent. He's the commissioner of fandom. He's got shows coming up in Lexington, Kentucky, in Southern California, in Atlantic City, Rochester, Baltimore, here in Doral, in Miami, and same time tomorrow is the Netflix special. Uh, brutal the way that went down yesterday, Sam, in that you know that that building hasn't felt like that in a while, and then Anunobi comes out all drugged up, and you get what you need from him and can never get back into the game because the Pacers put up a historic shooting performance. Well, look, Anunobi, I give him a lot of credit for coming out there, but you just said get what we need. I mean, you know, it's like popping a Viagra and giving you two pumps. You hit two nice shots. But it wasn't, you know, it's not the difference maker. He gave us five minutes. He he couldn't walk. So, you know, anyone who says this next season uh, wasn't a success, including Jalen, we're very proud of our team. Uh, But you can't say this Pacers team, although a great shooting team, would have beat the Knicks if they were fully healthy. Taking seven games to put us away, missing, what, over half our team? Stop shaking your head. And then... Well, uh, which which is the asshole? Which one of them? Whoever was shaking his head right there. That was Juju. 
good to meet you, brother. Mm-hmm. But I we seem were, to we I were, cut were. clips of you calling Joel Embiid soft as hell. He had a bad eye, bad back, bad yep. knee, bad body, yep. and you were celebrating, dancing on his grave, talking about how good the damn Knicks was. Now that y'all you lost one, with some damn you injuries, one now you want some sympathy. You had, Get your you ass out of here. Who was good enough to put up a 50-piece? The Knicks were missing six players by the end of this series. If you put on Ocean's Eleven and uh, – there's no Matt Damon, no Brad Pitt. You're just like, what, what the hell? Happened? This movie's not as good. No, shit. we're missing over half our rotation. OG was the answer on Pascal Siakam, and uh, he couldn't put up big nights against him. But once Josh Hart is guarding him, no shit, he's gonna get cooked in the post. He's much shorter. So, uh, yeah, I'm sorry the Sixers lost. I'm sorry, Joe Embiid, hell of a player. One injury, but he was able to. He was able to still play. And you had a fresh whole team. We didn't have Randall. We didn't have, uh, you know, OG this series. We didn't have Mitchell. Injuries are a real thing. All right, well, enjoy having Embiid never healthy for a playoff series because he never will be. He's Mr. Glass from Unbreakable. Uh, the Knicks will be back. I say we run it back. I hope we do. I think healthy were pretty damn dangerous, so I hope they keep it together. Cynthia. Cynthia Isaiah, OG. Cynthia, can you please put together for me a banner that says, uh, no way the Pacers beat us if we're healthy in Game 7 so that we can send it to Sam and have him put it up in his apartment? <laughs> and, when, when Dan, when you said real fans want a Game 7, this is why I told you you're a jerk-off. What are you talking about? Real fans want to win. We wanted to put this away in six, obviously. I told you I'd be there if there was a Game 7. I was there. Tough game to be at, but I wouldn't have it any other way. Sam, I didn't say uh, that you should want a Game 7. Yeah. I said that if you have real confidence in being the better team, why would you be afraid of a Game 7 at home? Do you, do you believe that injuries are not a real thing? I believe they're a real thing for everybody who's playing basketball this year and that no other fan base ever wants to hear about your fan base's injuries. That's fair, but it's it's a reality, and I think we are uh, we run it back next year. Hopefully, we're healthy. Hopefully, uh, we bring back OG and Hardenstein. I think they they were important of the team. Sam, I actually realized this series was over when they went to the OG moment. There's only so many times you can go for a Willis Reed moment. They already had one with Jalen Brunson uh, yeah. in game two at the Mecca. And so I knew the series was over when they went for another Willis Reed moment and OG came out looking like me. Like he looked like he was 93 years old. He could barely walk. Barely walk. And uh, and he hit two big shots. But you know when he couldn't barely walk? When he threw a dunk down on Joel Embiid. That was pretty fun. <laughs> But uh, I'm a Celtics fan. <laughs> Let's you know, look. He's a he's a hell of a player, and uh, look, bad luck is a thing. It'll it'll happen, and and we're grateful for. Here's the thing. It's funny is people do have some grudge against New York fans being happy because any other team is this depleted from injury. You're celebrating the resilience. You're like, holy shit, they they really fought with half their team. But for some reason, you know, not with the Knicks. Shout out Alec Burks. Great, great uh, series, despite oh, us having just no defensive answer for a, a sharp shooting Pacers team. And uh, we just didn't have the size. We were getting killed inside by Siakam so much. And uh, their shooting was great yesterday. You have to give your hats off to their shooting. But uh, I just don't think they get those looks if we have a healthy OG, if we have a healthy Mitchell Robinson, obviously. I mean, the defense is, is I mean, they got good looks on us. They, they're, we're killing us. Let's play some video here for Sam and see what it is that delights him or agitates him from all of the things yesterday. Let's begin with Stephen A. Smith making his entrance uh, into MSG. And to be fair to Stephen A. Smith, the Knicks didn't have enough healthy star power. He'd be like their second or third most famous Nick. So he should be dressed that way and he should walk in as if it's, in his, if it's his building. But I imagine it made Sam crazy to watch this. I don't care. I, it doesn't bother me. I mean, it is funny that he looks like a photographer in a safari in the 1950s for some reason. But uh, I mean, no, I like that he's that he's uh, fans should be there. You know, I'm glad that we have fans in the building, but uh, I don't think he's good luck. <laughs> I mean, is, is anyone arguing that, that we're like, oh, good, we're good. You know, I don't think it's it's a great sign that that Steve is there. 
Uh, I don't think I was like, oh, this is the juice we need to get us over the top. I don't think Isaiah Hardenstein's playing like, oh, good, the guy who never believed in me. You know, <laughs> I don't think he's helping us. Uh, he, he ain't Ben Stiller or Spike Lee. He ain't like a guy we're like, oh, oh, cool. Uh, but, uh, you know, at the end of the day, it comes down to the injuries, as I said. It doesn't really matter. Uh, can we stop? You sound I, defeated. <laughs> no, no, look, it's, no, he's, he it's, a fair po- it's a fair point. The injuries are a fair point. It's not up yeah. for dispute. But let's see if we can play uh, Paul Pierce here. This one surely will get Sam upset. Surely sure. this Paul Pierce stomping on Jalen oh, no. Brunson's jersey will surely upset what, what like, what? Sam. What? Homie, what? I mean, this guy is. This guy's in his mid forties. What is he doing? You know, right. it's just weird. Uh, why does he hate Jalen Brunson? I, and then he's offended by things about the Knicks. Paul, keep eating shortbread cookies. You're about to pack away from looking like Charles. <laughs> no, come on. No, Dan, it's weird. There's he no has... fat shaming here on WFAT. <laughs> but it's weird. He has no history with the Knicks. Like, what does he care? Let my boy cook. Paul Pierce. <laughs> yeah, I mean, look, the, I think the last time the Knicks played P- Paul Pierce and the Celtics in a series, we actually beat him. <laughs> Touche. Let's play for yeah. Sam. Uh, all of the Knicks appearing yesterday at the game. They were all dressed in black because they were at a funeral for the Pacers here. They all came in dressed yeah. in uh, black, including uh, Tibbs. Uh, you you have to do better than that if you're going to come in black. You know what's even better about that? That was game six. It's oh! <laughs> <laughs> <To> fine. <laughs> no, uh, yeah, look, how about Tyrese Halliburton wearing a different outfit coming in than, than leaving yesterday because he's got no confidence even against a half-healthy Knicks. Tyrese leaves in a Reggie Miller choke shirt. He shows up, and I'm sure some Prada runway horse shit that looked oversized and ridiculous on him. I didn't see what he came in in. But uh, the fact that he had a second outfit in case they won shows how little confidence Tyrese has, even against a depleted Knicks team. So congrats, you beat half our team. I'll give you, I'll give you half a congratulation. I love it. Next year, I can't wait to see him again. Uh, and I can't wait to cook their ass. Just got to bring back OG and uh, <laughs> we, enough of this uh, footage. Of the, <laughs> let's bring back OG and Isaiah and, and it's a wrap. I mean, we will we will beat them up. Siakam ain't putting up those numbers against a healthy team. How about That's, four front court players missing is insane. It's insane defensively. It's insane for your depth. So. You, you know. were you were in the building, uh, but you probably didn't catch much of the pregame. Some people in Indiana and elsewhere are bothered by how much Knicks bias soaked the entirety of the broadcast. Here's Stephen A. Uh, doing basically a pep rally for the Knicks. They ain't here right now. You understand what's at stake. It's been since 2000 that we've been in the conference finals. We've waited 24 years for this moment right here. OG Ananobi is back. Josh Hart's going to play. When you talk about game seven, it comes down to grinding. It comes down to guts. It comes down to who would have been. Come up in here. Come up in here, Spike Lee. You come right here. Right? Come oh. right here. This arm is the guys, baby. This oh, is what it's all boy. about right here. This is what we've been waiting for right here. It's game seven. This is what it's Get the hat. Put, Steven, put it back on the New York Knicks. It's about grinding. It's about guts. It's about heart. That's what games are. Read me. And when Clark is walking by, this is what it's about. This is what we waited for right here. One game, 48 minutes. Hundred blue skies, baby. Hundred blue skies. That is what it's all about, Bob. We'll go to game seven. I'm going back to my seat. That's right. That's right. That's right. It's about me. <laughs> Play that yeah, I mean, at my funeral. He's not, a, he's not a real, as I've said a million times, he's shown up this year for the first time. So I, is he a real fan? <laughs> God, why are you showing me this, Spike? Poor Spike. <laughs> uh, Spike's seen it all, man. He's seen it all. Uh, yeah, I, Stephen A., what do you, enough about well, He hasn't you. seen a title. He has. He's how old do you think Spike is? He has seen a title. Well, oh, we <laughs> haven't seen him watching a title being won. <laughs> That's fair. You won a lot. <laughs> <laughs> you won a lot.
but it existed. I'm sorry it was in black and white. It still exists. <laughs> you also deny the Holocaust? That oh, happened too. No. Yeah, I'm going no, there, Dan. No, no, I didn't. I knew this was feels like escalate. a lash out, Sam. I knew you were going to escalate it to there. Yeah. You, you, you cannot be trusted to not All this because he had to count on Alec Burks. <laughs> hey, Alec Burks looked good, though. You got to admit. I mean, <laughs> Thank you. Thank for being, you. For being this depleted, he did look pretty damn good. Bring him back. You're yeah. absolutely Mr. Right. Game 7. He's, uh, he's got shows coming up in Lexington, Kentucky, in Southern California, in Rochester, Doral, Baltimore. Same time tomorrow is the Netflix special. Let's leave him with some Tracy Morgan here. Tracy Morgan was very excitable during the game yesterday. This town is going to be fire! 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 <laughs> We've been a little quiet around here, Stugatz, recently, even though uh, sports fans more than ever, I think, are obsessed with the finances of sport. Mm -hmm. We've been quiet about what Tua is going to sign for. Uh, Jared Goff just got an amount of money that makes him the second highest paid quarterback in the sport after Burrow annually, over $50 million a year. The Jags, after seeing that, are said to be all in on Trevor Lawrence wanting $50 million a year. And if Trevor Lawrence and Jared Goff, whether they're system quarterbacks in the case of Goff or whether they're undetermined value in the case of Trevor Lawrence, if those two quarterbacks are going to get more than $50 million a year, and now Jeremy Fowler is reporting that Tua has missed some OTAs and is unhappy with the initial offer, Tua's going to get more money than people think he deserves. Like, Tua's going to get an amount of money that Trevor Lawrence is going to get and that Jared Goff is going to get, and people react to those contracts the same way they will react to Tua's saying, wait a minute, should he be one of the top five highest-paid quarterbacks annually, even though he's going to be? Diana Rossini is reporting that Tua showed up to OTAs today, so that's a good sign, I think, for Dolphin fans. Um, yeah, he's better than those guys. Like, last year, he had a better season than Jared Goff. He had a better season than Trevor Lawrence. He led the NFL in passing yards. His rating was 101.1. That is higher than both those quarterbacks. You have to pay the guy. I'm not saying it's right. I'm not saying Dolphin fans should be comfortable with him making $55 million per season. But you have to. You have to slot him in, don't you? The stuff that becomes complicated here, I don't know how to answer that question, Stugatz, because we're still talking a quarter about a quarterback no matter how quiet it was in this regard last year, who feels to me like more of an injury risk than the other two quarterbacks we're talking about. But here. he started 17 games last year. Like, that's what we said. The biggest thing headed into next season was could Tua stay healthy for an entire season? He did it, Dan, and he, he played did. well. That is correct. Yes. Uh, but if I'd asked you this question 17 games ago, you would have said, hell no. And you would have correct. said, absolutely not. Mm -hmm. And... He's had a year where you're not worried about a concussion happening within a month of another concussion, but there was no quarterback in the sport that we worried more about his health and his brain health than this one. Troy Aikman left the sport because of his brain health. That's how and why he got out, and I... In a salary cap sport, cannot say to you, once you've found a quarterback who has those kinds of numbers, I can't say to you, no, you don't give that quarterback money. But I have more trouble than I ever have in a salary cap sport that has now made it so that you have to have value at that position. It's not just have greatness. You have to have greatness and value so that you could build out the rest of your roster. I have a real hard time with Jared Goff's evaluation. For example, let's put two over here for a second. All right. Jared Goff, when he was with Jeff Fisher at the beginning of his career, truly terrible, thought he was going to be out of the league. The numbers were so bad, I didn't think he was going to learn anything. Then McVay comes in there and does with Goff what the Dolphins have done with Tua. It's the same sort of thing, get a bunch of skill guys around him. But the Dolphins did it when they had Tua at value. When they right. can afford yes. Tyreek Hill and Waddle because they've got Tua so cheap. The thing that I have trouble with in the evaluation is, and I think even the most ardent Tua supporters would agree with me on this, would he be this anywhere else? Is there another team in the sport 
that would pay him this way with the personnel that they have hmm. that isn't the one and two receiver that the Dolphins have and a scheme that makes Mostert at 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 nine million you only have to pay him what nine million dollars for twenty plus touchdowns right. because you know that any running back with speed you put back there is going to get you the numbers. I have a real hard time with the assessment of value when you tell me that Carson Wentz was once the highest paid quarterback in that sport not that long ago and that Jared Goff is now second. I'd like to think if you put Tua on the Lions, they're good. They have good skill position players that you would see similar type numbers. I do. I think every quarterback that has come up for these extensions outside of maybe Patrick Mahomes and Joe Burrow, we've asked these questions about. Can you invest that much? We've asked it about Josh Allen. Right. And really, when someone has had a season like Tua, there is really zero precedent for the team not If Jalen Hurts gets it. the money, then Tua's got to get the money. The only time a team has had a, a, a quarterback on a really affordable contract that actually did some winning, more winning than they, they've actually done down here in Miami, was the Browns with Baker Mayfield when they decided to part, and he had an injury-riddled season that wasn't very good, and it made that decision much easier for them. But outside of that, there is very little precedent for a team separating itself from the quarterback. Now, there is a lot of precedent for the team immediately regretting that contract and finding a way to get out from under it. The NFL salary cap is a lie. Roy, Hi. We, we have waited too long to talk about uh, some pretty important playoff hockey. I was scared of the Tampa Bay Lightning based on their history. I was scared of the Boston Bruins based on the last two seasons. You're scared of the Rangers, I'm aren't scared you? of the Rangers because they're better than both of those teams. <laughs> yeah, um, I'm a bit concerned about this one. Oh, uh, whoa! Wow. Concerned. Whoa! Oh, wow. Yeah, this, this is the big one. This, oh. is, this is the big one. It so, is the big one. This well, is the one we've all been waiting for. The next one's really the biggest one, but this yeah. is but for we now, got, the we got to get one. past this one. But this is the one you're the most scared of, yeah. or no? Is this the one you're most scared of? Out of all the matchups I can think of right now, yes. This you is were the more one. scared about the Rangers than potentially the Carolina Hurricanes? Because personally, I was a little bit more Same. nervous about that matchup. Same. No, no. I'm more scared about the Rangers because, I mean, I guess it's just Sturkin. You know, he's been playing really, really well in these yeah. playoffs. So, yeah, I'm, I'm a bit nervous about this one. This is a stunning admission from Roy. Roy has never admitted – he's always uh, covered in barbed wire and bravado. The last month is the most confident I have seen Roy over a month period in all the years Springing I've known Springing his him. step, yes. coming into work with something close to the muscles on his face that have atrophied, trying to get into a smile. Incapable of it, but you can see that they're trying to get to a smile – and now the Rangers, just because they've been the best all season, right? Like let's, let's not, and the Mecca. Let's right. not get it twisted, though. Panthers in six. Uh-huh. Oh, wow. But you're concerned. But I am concerned. With an asterisk of concern. Yes. Oh, man, not, got, my bad. Sorry, Brian. A little pinch of uh, salt in there in the concern. <laughs> Rangers got a lot of talent. They're their President's Trophy winning team for a reason. I think there is a huge talent gulf between the New York Rangers and the Boston Bruins, but they also play a different style. Like playing Boston really doesn't prepare you at all for what New York brings to the table. However, Florida looked pretty good against Tampa, and I think the game plan for Tampa is the game plan for the New York Rangers. Stay out of the box because this team is very good on the power play, and you're the better team, five on five. In fact, there are a few teams that have shown you they can actually hang with you 5v5. So I also think Panthers in six. I think it's going to be a really good series. Igor Shosturkin is a really formidable goalie. they got a lot of talent. Vinny Trocek has a – uh, has this insane ability to just really haunt his former teams. They've got really two good top lines. Zabinijad's a, a really good player. Panarin, who almost signed with the Panthers, he's been phenomenal. Probably deserve it of more Hart Trophy conversation around him. Kreider's their all-time postseason points leader. Saved he, the season. He just had a hattie, yeah, because it would have gone back to the Mecca after blowing a 3-0 lead. Tremendous, uh, really good de- uh, defensive lines. They have great rotation, a puck mover on every defensive t- uh, Adam Fox, defensive yeah. line, and they're very physical. So it should be a really fun series. Florida is better, though. I think that uh, people who pick their team in six, it's only because they're scared of seven. They oh, don't, oh, they don't want let's not do this again, Mecca. please. They don't want game seven. It worked out for the Pacers. Let me ask you something. Like, why would I be nervous about the Florida Panthers going into an arena that is labeled the Garden when you consider the one in Boston is basically our barn now? Huh. 
Roy looking confident over there, even though there is some concern. Can we talk about Kreider and the uh, the lawn situation that he had? He comes home. Uh, do you want this on your lawn after you've scored a hat trick? All of your neighbors have thrown their hats on your lawn, and now in the morning you're getting ready to <laughs> go to work and stuff, and your neighbors are invasive Jeremy by, Taché collection by too, throwing all their junk on your Who on, doesn't want that? On your like lawn. He looks so great. Cool. I mean... It's like my friend says, look. <laughs> also, also, get a walkway. Yeah. I mean, what are we doing here? That's, that's bizarre. That's a walkway that's usually covered in snow. Um, I want to talk a little bit about the Boston series because those joke uh, people up in Boston decided to throw garbage at the Florida Panthers. Act like you've been there before. This is an original seven against an original seven, and you throw garbage against our team. Against That is no way to treat your father. Not at all. You do not treat your dad that way. I can treat my dad that way. You cannot. You do treat your dad that way. Chris can treat his dad that way. I so neither, not them. I would never treat my dad. I think we buried the lead also. We have a fraudulent member, a former member of our cast, Chris Whittingham, who are just waving the damn New York Ranger flag oh, yeah. high and proud. We need to get his ass on the show this week oh, and yes. chastise him. I've, I've texted him <laughs> F you a lot over right. the last few days. But just if, if we may. Let's concentrate just a little bit more on the Boston series because the Florida Panthers dominated that six-game series, a six-game series in which they played well three times. Mm. Three poor efforts in that series, one of which they won because that Boston team stinks. Oh, come on. They come stink. On. Let have They're it. bad. <laughs> They're bad. That team stinks. A great job during the regular season by Jim Montgomery because when I saw that team on the ice against the Florida Panthers, I realized – Holy cow, that team over there in black and gold, they suck. They're that's bad. Not, that's not and true. And we kick their asses up and down the ice right. once we realize, oh, well, after a week off, we got a hockey series, I guess. Right. That dude tried to goon it up in game two, mm. made the narrative in the media a despicable one mm. when everyone should have been talking about how the Panthers are daddy. Daddy, At eat that show. Boston. You want to pretend like you're gatekeepers of the sport? You don't know where we play. Well, let me make it very clear to Bill Simmons. Home ice is the TD Garden. <laughs> Six straight in that barn. You got nothing on us. Garbage-ass team. Put it on the poll, please, Juju at Levitard Show. We're the Bruins sucking bad garbage-ass team this year <laughs> at Levitard Show. Put up Chris Whittingham. The Cheer your the loser-ass team as they raise their sticks in the air like they did something you should be proud of. They didn't do <laughs> They didn't do <laughs> Put up on the, uh, there, on the screen. Two there. years running. <laughs> Sent you packing. At least it was a short trip home for you guys. Hey. Is Barkov's hand okay? Hey, he showed uh, he showed Bucci Main both hands. He took a puck. I gotta say, Boston was probably gonna win that game. <laughs> we're not that. for Barkov. Yeah, yeah. yeah, yeah. cause Barkov absolutely <laughs> saved that game. That was hand of God situation. Yeah, right that that puck was absolutely going in. But that's the Selkie winner. I haven't heard you. We're we're this far into the show, and you have not congratulated our captain. Sasha yeah. Barkov for winning yeah, the Selkie man. Trophy, the I, second in his career. I love you asking if Barkov is okay, and Mike's response is he showed Bucci both hands. I mean, I mean, what do you expect him to say? <laughs> no, my hands, hands broken. <laughs> is he going to take? Uh, bo- is he going to take faceoffs? Is the real question. He's great at him. Uh, he, he dominated Tampa on the faceoff. Uh, Matthew Kachuk said uh, Sasha Barkov's the best player on the planet right now. Yeah. Hyperbolic. I think if there's a con Smythe. Uh, being handed out for the playoffs so far probably goes to Wyatt Johnson of Dallas. But Barkov's been unbelievable. The thing, the thing you guys are saying, though, this this part is truly disorienting to me as someone who has watched 30 years of really subpar to mediocre hockey. You guys, three different names you've given me, in the last 12 months on best player in the world who plays for the Panthers. You've given me three names on this, putting Reinhardt in the McDavid category, which seems crazy to me. I never did that. that you guys talked about Reinhardt and Barkoff and Kachuk yeah, this way. Yeah, Kachuk's a playoff performer. I would never put uh, Kachuk in that. And to be fair, I'm not the one calling Sasha Barkov the best player on the planet. I would not put those Kachuk players in Kachuk is doing the, that. Uh, Kachuk is doing that. And I would say for people that – or casually following the sport, don't really know what's going on, don't really know how the sport's changed a lot. Defense in that sport is really difficult to pick out. It's easy when Sasha Barkov is blocking a shot with his left hand. Here's something that Sasha Barkov does that 
maybe elite players back in the day used to do, but you're not used to seeing in hockey if you're just getting back to it. And that is an analytics play of carrying the puck into the zone, especially when you have an advantage. Usually what we all watched growing up was if we have the man advantage, pin it in deep. Dump it in, we'll get it, we'll reset. Well, analytics figured out that wastes about 25 seconds of possession time. So how do we get a better power play? You give it to your best skater, your best attacker. Sasha Barkov, at his size, you do not see players skate as beautifully as him. They scored a game-winning goal in Boston because of his ability to skate into the zone. That is what Sasha Barkov is damn near better at than anyone else in this league outside of maybe Nathan McKinnon. Being able to go on a rush, just skate between defenders, and carry a puck into their zone. Great decision maker. And the other thing on defense, when the other team's in transition, he's excellent in back checking. Just like Gus Forsling is great on back checking. He did get caught there. He did get caught. He, he got caught on a breakaway. Yeah, yeah but, that should have been an interference, probably. Yeah, yeah. but yeah, he's he's a play killer. He's definitely a play killer for the other team. We bury the lead here. Are you saying that you watched 30 years of bad hockey down here in South Florida? Yes. A second really? burying of the lead. A lot of Keith the, Ballard. You watched and, all uh, the Chris Verstein. With the volume up. I, mean, I have watched a lot really? of shitty hockey Christian in this <laughs> Wow. I think we buried another lead, which we covered a little on Friday, but not enough. Bill Simmons not knowing where the Panthers play. Can we relive this and play Three this sound for the people? Florida fans, settle down. You didn't know what hockey was until like 1993. Like you, you literally didn't have hockey. You've never won a cup. The average person who follows sports has no idea what city you're attached to. You're the Florida Panthers. Are you in Jacksonville? Are you in Orlando? Are you in Palm Beach? Are you, nobody knows. It's The answer is Miami. But li- literally most people don't know that. Including Bill Simmons. Yes. The sports guy. Including a lot of Panther fans, though, in his defense. I, mean. I don't think he's saying Miami, anything but... inaccurate there, other than the, the team plays in Miami. Look, that I don't, I don't know what I'm uh, – look, I just gave you that Sasha Barkov thing. I ripped it from a podcast. I'm from a swamp. There's only six people like me. We don't know anything about this sport. So continue on. Barkov's hand – did save that goal. Bobrovsky was wildly out of position. The photograph on how it is that Boston could have tied that series easily, if not for Barkov's hand, made it uh, pretty obvious that that would have been a uh, game-tying goal. The thing I wanted to ask you, though, Roy, because you mentioned you have to stay out of the penalty box. Tampa was better on the power play than the Rangers, correct? Was Tampa not yes, the yes, best Tam- team? Yes, Tampa they- was the best power play in the league this in season. The, in the entire sport, it was Tampa. And so the Rangers have that as an advantage. You don't obviously in any circumstances, <laughs> playoff hockey, regular season comp- uh, hockey, want to be down a man. But you're you're afraid more of Tampa's power play than you were of New York's ta- uh, power play. You're more afraid of Tampa's five than you are of – no. Any power play situation. I mean, I was based on past history. I mean, their power play in the playoffs, I mean, they basically murdered the the Panthers in recent playoff uh, appearances. But I mean, you gotta stay out of the boxing against this Rangers club because they're they're gonna they're gonna kill you. Tampa, because of the salary cap and all the winning that they've done, there's a reason why their roster wasn't what it looked like. They are nowhere near as deep. I mean they're they're there are guys on that <laughs> on that Ranger squad that would be the best player that are on that second line. You could p- pick any of those three, and maybe a third of the league, they'd be a bona fide first liner, best player, best scoring option over there. They've got their top six guys are really, really damn good. Whereas Tampa, you knew who you had to worry about. You had 86, and you knew Sam Coase who ended up being arguably the best player in that series, was going to be a problem. But where else are they going to get their goal scoring from? Not an issue. And again, as I mentioned, Benny Trocek, who has plenty of history as a Panther All-Star, was tripped, not called. Panthers got eliminated. Great player. Bad trade. Even though he didn't necessarily perform to that level in Carolina, he certainly did against the Florida Panthers. And he just made their lives a living hell in this series against Carolina, and he's bound to make our lives a living hell again. We're going to get to the gas bag of the week in a second, uh, but Roy, uh, help me with this sport. I have talked before about feeling that with very few exceptions throughout sports, uh, the ability to win one-score games, uh, Tom Brady 
had some of that, and you can some sort of, of that. Yeah, well, but I'm saying you can find the roots of how right. it is that he did it numerically. Sure. But largely, you cannot find teams that are good at winning one-score games across sports. The Marlins last year were a bit of a fluke because they got to the playoffs, but they had a a distorted record in one-score games because their bullpen was good. And there are certain things you can do to take the randomness out of it. The Panthers this year, though. And I don't want, just because I'm hopeful that they win the Cup, to be blinded by what I think is statistically hard to achieve, which is they're exceptional in one-score games. But the style that they play would also seem to be exceptional in one-score games. So is hockey different than the other sports where the randomness of one-score games is slightly less random? I mean, if you look at it in this series, I mean, the Panthers, like, they allowed goals in the first period by the Bruins. They scored first, and then the Panthers ended up coming back yeah. to win. So the Panthers are also good coming back into games oh, yeah. and then winning by one Cardiac goal. cats. Yeah, which, by the way, that, that Boston team is not a team that you want to go down. You see the anti-hockey that they play when they're chasing a game, when they have the ability to lock down with a one-goal lead. But you, you mentioned that entering this series. They've won the exact same number of one-score games as the New York Rangers. Well, the Rangers are very good at it, too. Yeah. It's 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 playoff it's hockey. Playoff hockey. Yeah, it, it's you can. I there really aren't any good predict. I haven't really heard any good predictive analysis when it comes to this series. And the reason why it's so difficult two years running with this Panther team is well, they've shown you in the postseason they're a bit of a different team. Chris, do you have the gas bag of the week uh, ready? You already took out Simmons, so I don't want to do that to him again, even though you have that in the library. Let's see who this week's gas bag of the week is. Gas bag of the week. Uh, excellent production, as always mm-hmm. here, sparing no expense whatsoever, going into the vault to find the highest of art to introduce this stuff. Here is Draymond Green uh, proclaiming the bad body language of the Timberwolves is the reason that that series was over when Denver went up 3-2. <laughs> Listen here, I got two things um, of why this series ain't coming back to Minnesota. Number one, the big Frenchman is sitting on that podium speaking his native language. We, we, we need to do this. You, you, you need to get a stop. It ain't we. Carl Anthony Towns is actually doing a pretty good job when he's on Joker. It's you, my man, that's getting cooked. So it's no we. Now, yes, you do need help from other guys, but on some of those, help can't help you. Like, you just got to get a stop. So that's number one. Number two, when you're in these playoff series, for, for me, I'm always looking for the smallest ounce of weakness that I can find. And the way Carl Anthony Towns walked off that floor with the <laughs> limp after he played the rest of that game totally fine and then he could barely walk leaving the court, they don't believe anymore. And when you lose belief, the defending champions you're playing against, when you lose the belief, it's over. And they don't believe they can win anymore, which means this series is over. <laughs> Put it on the poll, please, at Levitard Show. Juju, did TNT pay Draymond Green only to hate Rudy Gobert throughout the postseason? Because that was amazing to watch Draymond just spit hatred again and again. Of the top 15 players in the league, Stugatz, who are paid the most, only one of them is still playing. His name is Rudy Gobert. That's amazing. That's the one. <laughs> wow. A note on the Denver Nuggets. What? They, they won a championship, and they won a championship <laughs> last year in pretty dominant fashion. We, I lamented that I wanted to see them get tested to see the heart of a champion rise, and we finally saw them get tested, and they folded. It's like everything that I believed in, like what a championship assigns a team – is now into question with regards to this sport because the second they actually had to test that championship medal, the second that I thought it actually mattered against this young Minnesota team, especially a team with Rudy Gobert, who comes in, as Raymond Green has mentioned, with a reputation, Denver Nuggets showed that they weren't that guy, pal. It's funny because earlier in the series, they were down 0-2 going back to Minnesota. They won both those games. That's exactly what you're talking about. Like They were showing their championship pedigree right there. But to be up by 20 in a game seven when you have a three-time MVP and you're the reigning champs and not being able to close it out, 
That's insane. You guys man. can do all of that, and I will simply keep coming back to, hey, you guys know how good that defense is Minnesota's playing? Because it's know. championship defense. And and you can tell me it's about the medal of of the Joker, but I'm not questioning that dude's medal. He was tired. He had a great game. No, but I'm, I'm but he questioning was tired. everybody else. Uh, that's fine. The, the finals are supposed to make guys like Aaron Gordon and, and Porter Jr., and I, I know Jamal Murray had an injury, and I'm not questioning him so much, but, I mean, it's supposed to make those guys – Really good. That experience over there. And they end up getting worked by a Rudy Gobert team. I know how good that defense is. I know how good Rudy Gobert defenses tend to be entering the postseason. And then Rudy Gobert's not on the floor during those postseasons. He changed the narrative. I believe that what you just saw yesterday is everyone taking notice for the first time of Minnesota's defense. I have some funny sound here to play for the group because uh, I'm I'm kind of bummed, Stugatz, that OKC didn't go longer into the postseason right. just so everybody could have fallen in love with just how young they actually are, how young they behave, how happy they are to be in the <laughs> NBA traveling all over the United just States. Just happy to be there. I mean, right? they're just really young, but – if you didn't know, the Timberwolves are also really young. And when you put it, Carl Anthony Towns and Anthony Edwards in a press conference and you and Vince Goodwill, who's been covering the league for a long time, explains to them, and they might not have any working knowledge of the theory that old heads have in basketball, that if you're as young as they are, you have to fail big and publicly a couple of times before you're allowed to win the championship. No team like the Timberwolves has ever gone from where they've been straight to winning the championship before. You have to fall on your face a few times. And Goodwill asks them this question. And just listen, don't think of this as Anthony Edwards and Carl Anthony Towns. Just think of it as a couple of young guys who are a comedic duo who work well off each other when making fun of how bad their franchise has been. It, and usually in NBA history, it says you have to lose and lose big before you win. What is it about this team that says we lost not? last year? Yeah, but that, that, that's different. You have to lose at a bigger stage. Usually teams. Usually it's the playoffs. Lose. We lost last year. <laughs> we lost the last two years. <laughs> God damn. How much more we got to lose? Yeah, how much you want us to lose? We've been losing for 20 years. <laughs> I mean, that's just the truth, dog. God damn. <laughs> We've been losing for 20 years. He says next to someone who's 22. Someone who's 22 years old. My entire life. Hey, Anthony Edwards is out here at 22. How much more you want me to lose? I lost in the first round last year. That's enough. That's enough losing for I'm me done forever. Losing. Yeah. <laughs> but the first round I is lost usually... in a practice somehow. That's right. Well, Carl Anthony Towns, I don't know if he shook some of that reputation last night, but how many of you were out there waiting for him to go bad body language, go to be all the things Jimmy Butler said he was in a practice with Wiggins that we still talk about. In fact, I'd argue that before last night, the biggest moment of Carl Anthony Towns' entire career in terms of leaving a mark, positive or negative, is that in a practice, Jimmy Butler undressed him. It's like the signature moment where for years now we're talking about, is this dude soft? Is he mentally uh, strong enough to do what it is that he did in a game seven? Yesterday? He could win a title before Jimmy. How about that? Well, he was better yesterday than Anthony Edwards was. Uh, everybody's talking about what Anthony Edwards is, but six for 24. Kobe won a championship one time on six for 24 by grabbing a bunch of rebounds and doing a bunch of stuff in a game seven that Ron Artest bailed him out of. But six for 24 yesterday in a game seven, that'd leave a mark if they lost. Like that was not – that McDaniels and and – uh, Carl Anthony Towns ended up bailing out Anthony Edwards yesterday, who made a couple of threes when he needed to that were wide open threes, but that was not a strong showing. But what Anthony Edwards can do, Dan, when he doesn't have it going offensively, he is a great defender. That's and correct. they put him yeah. on Murray in the second yes. half. Murray was great in the first half, not so good in the second he half. He said afterward, Edwards came out of the locker room. They caught him out of the locker room. He said, put handcuffs on him. And yes, that was... We talked earlier in the series about what they'd be able to do on the perimeter with Murray and how important it was, and you saw that offense rendered impotent by what they did to him. He's a great defender. Murray was hurt, and he's going to need to be a great defender in the next round because there's a team that has done its suffering with a young superstar that seems also impossible to stop. And I want to do like a sports cable television topic right now. Which duo would you rather have, Edwards and Towns or Kyrie and Luca? 
for a series for this series because I know I think I know who the better supporting cast is. I think the Minnesota Timberwolves are a little bit de- uh, deeper, depending on which PJ Washington you get for Dallas. Because sometimes I watch that guy; and he's like freaking Steph Curry out there, and sometimes right. you'll you'll be invisible a little bit. But same with McDaniel's though, right? I but Nas Reed, I think that was like a, a star making performance. It I know was. he entered; yeah. he had some hardware attributed to his name, but that was a but, star but making Mike, performance. When you say best, Rudy's a Hall of Famer, when you say best duos, it sort of doesn't account for the fact that Rudy's not only a Hall of Famer; he's an All Star, and he's an All Star defensively. So it's doing an entirely different set of things than your duo is doing. Your Sixth Man of the Year is also providing stuff that um, your duo isn't providing. Minnesota Minnesota is not here because of Anthony Bennett, uh, Anthony Edwards, and wow. Carl Anthony yeah. Towns. Trash. Yeah. Anthony Can Bennett, the Wisconsin coach? Anthony, uh, They're not here because Sam of those Bennett? guys offensively, though. That's not why they're here. Well, they're, they're going up against two uniquely gifted offensive superstars that – if you ask anybody, like I could be draped all over them in that league, and they're still getting their shots off, and it doesn't matter what I do defensively. And Kyrie and Luca are those guys, pretty much. So I can't wait for this matchup. There haven't, even though there have been some upsets, it's been an NBA postseason that hasn't had games that get its hooks into you. There have been like maybe five good quality games because of the way that the sport's been. Close games. Yeah, Close yeah. Games. Like games that'll. I wasn't watching with the sound on. Until the second half, and I was watching with the sound on. I thought that game was over, given what I've seen in this postseason. When a Mike. team goes up fifteen, generally they end up going thir- going up thirty in that in that you, sport. Uh, but you have checked out on loving the sport the way that you used to, and what you're saying, while it might be true for you and your casual interest, is not true for Juju. He's eating up every bit of this. If you just simply love basketball uh you are watching things that don't require the late game buzzer beaters in order to appreciate the kind of uh players that I'm, watching I'm watching right it now. I'm watching it I'm saying like I'm not saying you're not watching soul it. Focus I'm, to. I'm saying that you need Mike you're at a point in your sports fandom where you need extra you're at your the, the same way that heroin users need more and more heroin to get the same high that they used to get that's where you are with your sports consuming right. where basketball you needed to keep being all what the Sixers and the Knicks felt like at the end of the games right no I, I appreciate you putting it on me I, I think you're absolving a sport from its issues I mean the sport the sport has issues it's it's not just and it's issues. not a Mike Ryan issue the sport has issues the sport has issues is it a playoffs we look is this just fantastic I was on the I was a hundred thousand feet above the earth Rudy shot the ball I saw the ball out the window <laughs> it went in the whim come on I, I don't I don't I don't doubt that any playoff basketball is better than regular basketball but it's happening at a, a time in the sports calendar where there are things that are going on that are just a personal interest more to me that I find a little bit more traumatic hell the sound was on at the NASCAR all-star race and it remained on to well after the race because even NASCAR gave us a moment worthy of sound well get you to that. sound like me watching NASCAR oh, they're just driving around in a circle I'm bored as <laughs> we'll get to the fight. We got a fight in NASCAR as well. But Jeremy, uh, you have a little something here for Stugatz. How Stugatz did you hear the name Anthony Bennett and right. go to Wisconsin, coach? Like, were you talking about Tony Bennett, the Virginia coach? Tony Anthony Bennett, Bennett was an assistant at Wisconsin. Look it up. So, so that's where we got from yes. Anthony Bennett. Yes. The mistake for Anthony Edwards, yes. not the number one pick in the NBA. Anthony, no, what Bennett. happened was he just googled uh, Tony Bennett and to see if lucky. there was any. Yes. Co- Is that what it was? Connection to Wisconsin. Wisconsin assistant. Yes. Name Anthony another Bennett, of course. Name another lead college basketball assistant. It's amazing. Right now, go for it. I can't. That was staggering. The way got that lucky. Stugatz uh, waited. Stugatz, hold it on. Was your mistake. Hold on. Yes, it was initially my mistake. Anthony Bennett at least was a Minnesota Timberwolf. And Dick Bennett was the head coach for the University of Wisconsin at uh, one point. But what, his, mis- connection. his mistake, at least, there was not Anthony Bennett that played basketball for the Timberwolves. I can understand it. <laughs> Stugatz is spinning around as if he's won something here. It. And I wish to examine what just happened, which is the following. I want to let people look behind the curtain. Right. Because he's got to go to an internet search the moment he realizes he said Anthony Bennett yeah. and he said it incorrectly. And now <laughs> he's going to search the entire... Entirety of the internet to find 
You mentioned Dick Bennett for some reason. Uh, You're just uh, firing Bennett. in all directions, and it is shrapnel. It's just stuff that he spews in all directions, trying to be right somewhere. Please, Jeremy, find for me when Anthony Bennett was an assistant at Wisconsin. What years do Gotts is referencing? That was Tony Bennett. Anthony Bennett made it all the way to head coach. I mean, Tony Bennett was an assistant coach at Wisconsin from 1999 to 2003. <laughs> so that was the era that you were referencing Stepping stone, yeah. as a victory for you. <laughs> Let's go uh, here. I want to get to some Malone sound. Mike was talking about Denver being tested and you saw when he won that Malone spent a lot of time trolling the Lakers he really enjoyed himself the tone slightly different when you've lost a game seven at home absorb a loss like this after after going ahead by 20 next question man the season's over that's what's hard being up 20 season's over. You don't understand that. The season's over. It's hard. Stupid ass questions. <laughs> Ooh. It is warm. That was rude. <laughs> I feel like his answer was dismissive enough. He didn't need the dismount of stupid ass question. I mean, he lost to Gobert. Uh, let's just play that again uh, because this is how it goes down. Uh, the bitterness of losing when you're a champion who last offseason got to parade around with you through ch chains on. Did he have grills at one point? Uh, he had uh, he called Brucey B. Wait, wait, look at him without Brucey B. You look like an <laughs> idiot without Brucey B. And I said it. <laughs> play that again. Well, how hard is it just to absorb a loss like this after after going ahead by 20? Next question, man. The season's over. That's what's hard. Being up 20. The season's over. You don't understand that. The season's over. It's hard. Stupid ass question. <laughs> Do you think the reporter understands that, though? I, mean, <laughs> I believe the reporter couldn't have gotten a better answer from Malone. It's perfect. It is a flawless answer. It just sounds and looks a lot different than he did when he was double-fisted. Is that Paul Wall? Telling everybody to, <laughs> to smoke it last year when they won the title. And now uh, it goes down a little differently when, uh, when Minnesota's sending all those young people and big bodies at your – three-time MVP. Uh, rarely do you get that kind of distilled honesty from a coach. He could have just left it at next question, and we all would have known that he thought it was a stupid-ass question. <laughs> One more time, play that bitterness so that we can just drink those Denver tears. Goodbye, worthy champion. We're done with you. Well, how hard is it just to absorb a loss like this after, after going ahead by 20? Next question, man. The season's over. That's what's hard. Being up 20. The season's over. You don't understand that. The season's over. It's hard. Stupid ass questions. <laughs> I read over the weekend, I did not know this, Stugatz, that last week in the UK, because it was a mental health awareness week, and because 48% of the kids in the U.K. feel pressure to be happy all the time, mm -hmm. McDonald's stopped calling it the Happy Meal. What? For the week, because uh, kids don't want the pressure all the time, 48% of them, to be happy. That's they a really low number it when is. you really think about it. Too low to change the Happy Meal. Certainly, because why would they feel pressure in England to be happy? Right. No one else is. <laughs> the McDonald's team that worked on this, while I'm all for any dialogue that starts and makes easier conversations around mental health, I don't need them around what is now being called the meal instead of the happy meal. It's not being called the sad meal. Right. It's just the meal, and they've removed the happy. And I feel like you've gone too far if you've removed the happy from the happy meal. Put it on the poll, Juju, at Lebetard Show. Have you gone too far if you've removed the happy from the happy meal?
Uh, Dan, so you're telling me you go to the drive through at McDonald's and you simply, last week, and you order the meal? That's correct. That's a number eight. Um, I mean, the meal is that's what eight? a meal is. Yes, a happy meal is something. If I'm sad, it makes me happy. There's a beautiful toy inside, a fun toy inside, and there is great food inside, and it comes in a nice little box that makes you happy. Well, they're removing I mean, a sticker smile. They're removing the happy uh, smile. No. Now the it's just what? a flat line. Uh, to be fair, they, they didn't remove it. They... You still can put the smile on there. They gave you stickers. But no pressure to put the smile no, on no, there. No, no pressure whatsoever. They gave you like several, a handful of options. So if you want like a, a, a happy meal with just like a straight line for a mouth, you have that option as opposed to being force fed a smile. I've got to salute, even though I'm against the principle of this, just because I want my fat and happy comfort food and I want it to always be happy. I really do have to salute whoever was in the marketing meeting that thought that this was a good idea to try to have McDonald's enter this conversation when McDonald's can just as well stay out of this conversation and not be participating at all, which is what a lot of corporations would choose instead of stuff that would take the name, the happy, off of an iconic meal for a week. It is dumb, Dan. I can promise you the cure for mental illness is nowhere on the McDonald's menu. Okay, thank you. I promise you. you. Okay. Okay. Not even a milkshake? Uh, ridiculous. Okay. I mean, I, uh, it's uh, not a happy I'm not ordering a meal. It's not a happy meal. Yeah. I want a happy meal. A McFlurry. Well, it's a really positive message, though, on the on the box, that it's it okay is. to not be happy all the time, and normalizing that kind of It's a message. Is, it's is a, a message. It's a really know. good message to it's, have. It's a message. I'm not sure if it's a positive message. You could have kept the happy there for me and kept it a positive message right. call it the bah humbug meal while you're at it Jeez. Right. yeah but this is a meal you get to make yourself happy not, not they're always. giving you less opportunity well, to be happy well sometimes if you're not feeling happy and you're just surrounded by joy you just become more unhappy because you start questioning why am i not this happy preach couldn't the the happy meal make you happier ideally yeah, in a perfect look, it's, world? There's, it's mental health. Isn't it? There isn't an, a, like a, a turnkey answer for all of this. Otherwise, it wouldn't be what it is right now. But uh, Have you, you had know. those fries? I mean, They make me happy. They, they make, make everyone happy. happy. Yeah. happy. <laughs> they make me happy. But sometimes when I'm in my feelings, I'm having those fries. I just, you know, I see. You know yeah. just digging deeper. Right. Mm-hmm. Pressure to be happy is bad? Yeah. If yeah. you're not happy, the pressure to be happy sometimes is bad. I felt that. So yeah. Yeah, it's a, it can be bad if you start wondering, why can't I have a good time? I've been, when I was going through a really bad mental health stretch, I was at a Jack White concert in Portland. I had great seats. I was right in front of Jack, and I was a misery. Like, if you told me in a vacuum, that would be one of my happiest places ever. And I, I left that concert early because I was just wondering the entire time, why am I not happier? Oh, I believe that this right here, what you've just articulated, is something that right now is a plague everywhere where people can't get outside of whatever their individual problems are to have the gratitude that is necessary on the pie chart of happiness for wherever it is you arrive but right but i I felt even worse about it knowing that i normally i'd be having a great time here and i'm surrounded by people having a great time and i was still trying to understand it so to hear a message that that's not that's not messed up like it's okay to feel that way sometimes and now coming through it even though you know it's a lot like recovery you're always you're going to run into triggers but i do feel like for a large extent that i'm out of the woods now looking back on it i i would have loved a message knowing that it's going to be all right Uh, this isn't forever there are things that you could do about this it's okay to not be okay so it's a good message it's a it's a bridge too far to me just because i want to eat my mcdonald's without thinking of that at all and i will be unhappy after eating the mcdonald's because i've eaten the mcdonald's and it's not what i should have been eating uh in order to keep my body working the way that it's supposed to but i do actually while i'm making fun of it celebrate the idea that any fat, happy corporate entity would dare to walk into any of these waters, even though it's not something for both United States and the UK. It's only in the UK. It's one It's one branch of McDonald's sticking its finger up in the air. And do we dare to, hen- to enter the mental health crisis? Uh, it's not all of McDonald's because you generally don't have these corporations wading at all into 
uh, these waters. It's I, it's funny that there isn't a uniform policy when it comes to menu items. You go to Japanese McDonald's, they have all these different crazy menu items that you become envious of. The Happy Meals are different too. When I went to Mexico recently, the Happy Meal for, for Mexico was kind of a little messed up. It was like, let's indoctrinate a future workforce. Here's the Happy Meal get, uh, giveaway. drive through headsets. Here's a, a nameplate that says McDonald's. Like every McDonald's around the planet has geo-targeted Happy Meals that are different. They're franchised, though. I mean, you have the right as an owner, you have the right to do what you want with that menu, correct? But you say, I, I always thought my myopic Americanness that uh, if my Happy Meal was a Jurassic Park uh, Happy Meal, or if I had the uh, Batman Forever, cl- man, that was such a money glass. Yeah, yeah, yeah. What a great giveaway. The Batman Forever glass set, I just assume that, you know, uh, a kid in Norway would be getting the same thing. It's not always the case. Uh, Juju, what does the rest of your collection look like? What is the cupware, uh, other sophisticated and charming uh, cupware that we have in the Juju household? I got four uh, good cups. Uh, what's the Batman one? It's the Joker. It's the Riddler with the question mark uh, oh, handle. That was a good one. And I got the cup I won in the fantasy uh, Guillermo Mafia League. Salute to Guillermo. Oh, nice. Any uh, Flanagan's cups? Are they as good as the Flanagan's cups? <laughs> Absolutely. Every single cup is wet. I'm not going to blaspheme. It's equal to the fan, uh, Flanagan's, Flanagan's cup. Thank you. Well said. He knows, well when, he's, said. He knows when he's playing well on the said. road. Yes. He knows when he's playing on the road. Toe in the line, Juju. Yeah. I, mean. I don't think we're ever going to mention it, but I do want to mention that Tyson Fury lost over the weekend. That was no, great. I was going to mention it because I want to talk about I've not seen him look like that, Stugatz. Uh, and you now have a, a, a unified title in the heavyweight uh, division, which I'm guessing most of the people listening to this do not know the Ukrainian heavyweight who beat Anthony Joshua twice and did that. Or how to, to pronounce his name. Uh, it's Alexander Usyk. Yes. It's how nice. you pronounce his name. Oh. Yes. And he is, that shouldn't get a celebration because I know the name of the heavyweight champion of the it world. Should, man. Uh, uh, I mean, I was scanning. I was like, do I venture out into this yeah. microphone and say Usyk? I'm not sure. You went right after it, man. And, well, he, he's, you knew it. he's right. done something very impressive. And I, Tyson Fury, let's go ahead and play. Tyson Fury was trying to clown this person. Yeah, Fury came in looking like he was in pretty good shape he looks spry early on and it, it, it would appear that one of the best pugilists we've seen in the heavyweight division got out box let's watch this because he uh he, he won it's hard to beat the champion with a split decision it has to be an overwhelming fight in order to take the champion's title and here is fury let's go ahead and play this fury was clowning him and then he wasn't clowning you've not seen fury look like this deontay wilder knocked him out and i thought that was going to be the end of fury and he got up after eight seconds like the undertaker but you've never seen fury look like this so the body is well we see Five minutes later. Three minutes, stop it! No! Fury! He's down! The corner knocked down! Two, three. Saved by the ropes, saved by the bell, saved by having a hundred years of ancestors who know how to stay on their feet when they've been punched by bare knuckle. <laughs> Seriously, that guy... That's a skill. That, that guy... <laughs> able to stand around with that chin and not go down, I'm telling you, that comes from ghosts and spirits from Grand Paul would headbutt you. He would headbutt you if he had a, disip- a, a dispute with you during the Great Depression. <laughs> these are, these That's are, deep, These man. are people who fight in the streets for money. Like, uh, and that's what Usyk uh, defeated, and I don't think people understand what it is to beat Anthony Joshua twice, which he's also done. Like, I know we don't care or understand what might be inside the roots of a fighter from Ukraine. Going up against, like, the guys that you mentioned, these are bigger, stronger dudes than he is. So much bigger than him. What are you laughing about? Ukraine, because you're right. It's different. Oh, just all of it. (laughs) This crazy run of his kind of times out with what's going on over in Ukraine. And you got to imagine. I mean, weren't the Klitschko's, like, in active service? Aren't they still, like, over there trying to free their – like, his mind is certainly elsewhere during this height of his career. Lomachenko as well. You uh, you guys uh, know that I love boxing and fighting, and because it's the most primitive, barbaric thing to be stripped down to just, I got to go in there and fight this other person for money. But when I've talked to trainers who in the corner in the ninth round are telling their fighter some form of the family's not going to be able to eat if you don't stop being tired here or stop 
losing, God knows what that person brings into the ring with him to beat a Tyson Fury. <laughs> because Tyson Fury is a really worthy heavyweight champion who's beaten all comers. The Klitschko's you mentioned, he ended their reign. And their reign would have been the most impressive thing in the history of American sports boxing which is not something that the Klitschko's are not regarded as one of the great brother teams of all time because they're not American, but they'd be looked at like Venus and Serena Williams or the greatest combos we've ever had if we happen to care about them as Americans. He ended their reign. That dude has been an impressive, gangly and weird, because I don't get it. Love handles is not what we associate hard with Hard to that. explain. Very hard to explain. Tyson <laughs> like the Joker. Right His yeah. situation. <laughs> with love, with more love handles, with 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 my, what would look like my body, I'm fitter, I believe. Oh, whoa, 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 physically whoa, whoa, whoa. careful. No, put, no, no, put no, no, no. Not entering this fight. Not entering this fight. I, 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 <laughs> everything that Diddy was as an icon, as a empresario, as an influencer, as uh, somebody that meant something, meant a different time to people. It's all extinguished with the horror of that video that TMZ released that was combined with Stugatz, um, him being defiant about the ways that he denied all of this stuff, just lying through his teeth on, uh, you know, videos that had to be uh, bought to sequester uh, Cassie Ventura, someone that was not mentioned in his apology, an apology that people rang, that thought rang hollow because they're like, you're doing this because you got caught. You're not actually remorseful for the behavior. Rem you're remorseful for having been caught. I had the reaction as soon as I saw that video, the need to say, oh, it's over. His freedom is over. The Everything that Diddy used to be is over. How did it feel? Because you don't know if it's over, and you proclaim that something is over. And so I'm just well, wondering how I, it felt I, I, well, in the moment. Well, it feels right. like justice, right. Dugans. Mm -hmm. It feels uh, when, when injustices uh, come to the forefront that way and are put in the light, and you see that uh, what someone has been pretending to be unravels. And, you know, I'm filled with a great deal of sadness, right? I, you saw that thing that went viral recently where women were asked, um, you know, whether or not they, in the woods, they'd rather confront a man or a bear. And if, uh, the answer often was a bear with reasoning along the lines of, well, then it would leave marks and people would believe me. Everything Diddy was worked in his favor for us to mythologize that he was a better person than he was. And it made it very hard for Cassie Ventura to come forth. But now we've all seen the video. And it's truly horrifying. It's something you, I, I'm going to have to put trigger warnings over everything we're doing here. I'm not going to show the video here because most of you have seen it. And if you want to see it, you can. But Jamel Hill is with us now to help us sort through some of what it is that's here. Um, you can see her and hear her at It's Jamel Hill on YouTube. Uh, let's start there with the trigger warning as we talk about Diddy Jamel. Uh, we're talking about domestic violence caught on camera, along with more allegations of physical and sexual abuse, many of which Diddy continues to deny. What do you make of the events of the weekend? What do you make of the apology sort of uh, video from Diddy? Well, uh, I remember, Dan, we talked about Diddy not too long ago. And I said then that his career was over. And this is before this video came out, because I just thought the mountain of allegations. And uh, although if people want to put it in the box of being unproven, that's fine. But it was just too much. And there was nothing. Uh, and given the nature of the allegations, why would somebody ever want to work with him again? And certainly we've seen a lot of celebrities who have been in his situation forgiven. And even now there are people who think that apology, that crappy, awful apology was enough because I, I couldn't help but notice in the apology, he never apologized to Cassie and nor did he even address the fact that when her lawsuit first surfaced, he immediately denied everything, called her a liar and essentially said that this was just about a money grab. And so he created that narrative. So to me, if you're trying to get everybody to believe that you are feeling or that you have dealt with some measure of accountability, that ain't it. 
you, I mean, you, you know, knowing people who have gone to rehab, people in my family who have gone to rehab, my mother has gone to rehab, my father has gone to rehab. One of the first things that they teach you is about making amends and being accountable to the people that you've harmed and being honest and transparent about what you've done. So if he really had gone to therapy, if he really had some level of accountability that he felt like he was exercising, then we it wouldn't have taken this many years for him to be honest about what he actually did. And let's just say, okay, maybe he doesn't want to open that Pandora's box. As soon as this lawsuit dropped, it shouldn't have had to, it shouldn't have taken a lawsuit and subsequently a video for him to say he was being accountable. So personally, I wish he would have stayed silent um, because what he offered was worthless. And uh, I felt, uh, you know, a lot of empathy toward not just Cassie, but also a lot of domestic violence uh, victims who I'm sure seeing how this tape went viral, that it, it triggered something in them. You know, I had a conversation with a friend who said her husband was very triggered by it because he grew up in an abusive household and seeing that on tape, um, you know, was awful for him and, and conjured up some memories for a lot of people. It, it reminds me of the reaction when the Ray Rice video happened. A lot of people did not know what domestic violence looks like. And, uh, you know, I, I think we we always seem to arrive at this point. You know, women allege things, and especially if it's against a famous celebrity of Diddy's stature, or not even as famous as Diddy, but just anybody in the public limelight, people go out of their way to extend a level of a level of the benefit of the doubt to the celebrity, to the powerful person, like they're related to him. Like, you don't know these people. You don't know what he does behind closed doors. You don't know anything about them other than they entertain you. And so I don't know how many times we have to learn that the people that are often in the public eye are not who you think they are. They are plenty terrible, both videos, Ray Rice and Diddy. But for those who somehow miss the Ray Rice thing, Jamel, the idea of kicking someone a couple of different times in front of an elevator who appears to be incapacitated is a level beyond even where Ray Rice was. Oh, yeah, because one thing, it's so many things to notice about this video. One, she was trying to leave. Two, I don't know what the situation was in this hotel, but he felt empowered enough that he could run down the hallway of a hotel in a towel and assault this woman. And she's just laying there taking the abuse and everything about this setup. It was clear that this was something that regularly happens in the dynamic of their relationship. She wasn't fighting back. She was just there, just kind of accepting this horrible thing that was happening to her. And I gotta be honest, watching that and seeing that level of rage I, it is, it, it's not lost on me that he could have killed this woman because we don't know what happened when they got back in the room where the cameras couldn't see, or for that matter, the things that aren't on video. And by the way, very specific language that did he use when he said that he apologized for what we saw on the video. Well, what's happening outside of the video is what is most alarming to people because if you will be willing to do that in a hotel where you know they have cameras everywhere what are you doing to this woman when there is no one else around let's play the apology for jamel here and just to get the visceral reaction because the apology uh, was something that landed wrong with just about everyone and just about everyone was wondering what kind of advice he was getting that he felt the need to do this, that he felt that this would be better than silence. It's so difficult to reflect on the darkest times in your life. But sometimes you got to do that. I was f***ed up. I mean, I hit rock bottom. But I make no excuses. My behavior on that video is inexcusable. I take full responsibility for my actions in that video. I'm disgusted. I was disgusted then when I did it, I'm disgusted now. I went and I sought out professional help. I had to go into therapy, I'm going to rehab. I had to ask God for his mercy and grace. I'm 
so sorry. But I'm committed to be a better man each and every day. I'm not asking for forgiveness. I'm truly sorry. What uh, other thoughts do you have beyond not uh, apologizing directly to Cassie or mentioning her by name? Uh, no apologies to his children. Um, Diddy has twin daughters. He also has a, a young toddler that's a da daughter. And really, it's not that he has to apologize to just merely the women in his life, because he has sons, too, who are looking at his behavior uh, every day. And God knows what these children have seen. And he has not only publicly humiliated them, uh, he's also left them with the, probably a level of trauma that, you know, most of us probably can't even possibly you know, fathom. The other thing that sticks out to me, uh, the other thing that sticks out to me about this apology is just the raging narcissism. It's like he made this thing all about himself from the beginning, talking about he was in his darkest place. You think Cassie wasn't in a dark place when you sitting up here pummeling her, um, you know, like she's not even a human being? I mean, it, it, that to me, it was so many things that were so awful about this apology. And I have to think, and part of the reason he made it is not only, again, a delusional level of narcissism, but also probably because there's some part of him that thinks that he will be accepted back and welcomed back on some level, um, you know, into the mainstream. I mean, they're going to be apologists. They, even in various comment sections, you see them. There are going to be some people who still have no problem listening to his music. There will probably be some people who have no problem engaging in a business relationship with him. And... That is what is just so distasteful about this being some this being his idea of accountability is that he really thought that he was going to incur some level of sympathy after we've seen that tape. And there just frankly isn't any not for me and I think from the vast majority of people. Jamel, what's equally disgusting about this is the hotel covering it up. Like, whoever took the money, whoever kept this quiet for this long, like, how do you feel about that, sis? Yeah, I mean, I think you're you're right. That's another aspect of this is, like, I don't know what hotel this was, but I, part of me hopes Cassie drops another lawsuit on them as well be, because that is not, this is not at all what they're supposed to do. They see a violent crime actually committed in their hotel, and he was able to pay them off. But I hope people... And, and, and I'm glad you brought this up for another reason, because even now, so many people blame Cassie. Well, she should have perished charges instead of taking the money. If he was powerful enough to get this whole this tape suppressed, why would they think she would believe in her mind, especially at that stage and even years later, that she had any recourse in terms of getting some level of justice through the criminal justice system? I, I don't, I mean, it's very easy to believe and see why she didn't because Diddy is a very powerful person. But yeah, that hotel, whoever took the money to suppress that tape, I mean, just a disgusting person. And, you know, uh, unfortunately, I think because there have been so many allegations swirling around him, the, the only reason this tape is coming to light is because whoever took the money to suppress it in the first place or however this came out, there's no fear of Diddy anymore because his entire career, persona, reputation is completely obliterated and in shambles. So there's nothing, there's, it's just like, hey, why not? Everybody else is, is kicking them. So let me get my turn in and, and maybe even get another payday out of it. So, uh, but yes, definitely that hotel is like, that's just despicable um, to see something like that happen and to, you know, take any kind of hand, uh, take any kind of payout so that somebody like that wouldn't be brought to justice. Jamel, I've been fascinated by the start of Caitlin Clark's pro career and mostly the reaction from the rest of the WNBA. It seems like the other players do not want her to succeed. What do you make of what, that? While, <laughs> while, 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 while Luther Campbell and Jeff Teague say that everything should be made easier for Caitlin because she's got to have an easier start to the season. And that's what I love about Stu guys. Bring it back to sports, uh, Stu guys. Get Always. us together. Yep. <laughs> yep. I mean, okay, so this is this is probably the issue lately that is probably pissing me off the most. And uh, th this this coddling and patting women on the head, and particularly this particular uh, woman, just because, um, one, it's an insult to her. And what this really exposes is a few things that a lot of people bought the narrative that the WNBA wasn't that good. 
And because they bought this narrative that has, you know, come to life throughout, you know, years of people denigrating this league, despite the fact that those of us who actually watched it saw that it was really a good product. And the fact that ratings have gone up in the last four or five years really indicated that people understood that this is a, a good product. And not only that, these women are the best professional uh, women's basketball players in the world. So it, it exposed all of the bad narratives that people bought about this league to begin with. Then the second part of this is thinking that the only way the WNBA could be successful is to coddle Caitlin Clark, who you all have seen the competitor that she is. She does not strike me as a woman that wants to be coddled and for things to made easy. And they're saying things about her and about the players' response to her that they would never say about men in any professional sport. You know, when Magic and Bird came into the league, uh, you know, in 1979, 1980, you know, the NBA finals there on tape, tape delays, you know, the league was suffering a lot of problems. I don't think any of the professionals that they played with, any of the other men said, you know what, because of, you know, Magic and Bird are coming off the most watched NCAA final in history, uh, we need to take it easy on them so we can ensure the growth of our league. It's an asinine idea. And uh, again, it just, this is where coverage and commentary of women's sports have got to grow up because it, it wasn't just Luther Campbell and Jeff T. Our former colleague, Colin uh, Cowherd, said essentially the same thing, that the league should have had the foresight to give her an easier schedule so that she would look better and therefore <laughs> what is there that, would be what, more what is that more? Is it condescending or patronizing? Like if you had to oh, try... It, <laughs> it's the it, herd. I, don't, I mean, it, it's all of them. Oh. It's, it's condescending. It's, patron, it's, it's, it's patronizing. It is paternalistic. It is all those things. And I was like, this firmly falls in the camp of shit never said about males, uh, men's sports and, and, and male athletes. And, you know, I guess they don't, didn't understand it's, it's 12 teams in the league. Uh, I think like eight of them make the playoffs, which means they wanted her to have an easier schedule. Her team is the easy team on the schedule. Okay? <laughs> this, <laughs> this, this just is when you get the number one draft pick, yeah, you're true. a bad yeah. team. Okay? <laughs> and so I think they just, they, it was, uh, it just exposes the fact they didn't think very much of the other women who played in the league in the first place. And now, and to me, it's this, either you believe Caitlin Clark is good or you don't. And if she's as good and as great and as anointed as you all, as a lot of people were trying to make her in the women's, in women's college basketball, which she absolutely deserved. If she's that level of talent, if she's the generational talent that her fans believe she is, then she'll be fine. So either you don't believe she's that good or you're having to reconcile with the fact that no, she wasn't going to come into the WNBA and drop 40 points a game, that these other women she's playing against, many of them are stronger than her. They're veterans. Um, they just, uh, you know, the, it's a different level of athleticism and skill that she's facing, but she will adjust. I mean, she has already had a couple of 20-point games. I have no doubt that once she finds her groove, she will be fine, but they have to stop this silly coddling because – it is just so insulting on so many levels, particularly to the professional women who have really put so much sweat equity into making this league grow and getting it to the place of where it is and just into their own personal careers. They act like women aren't supposed to have personal pride. Like they're not supposed to be competitors too. Like just let Caitlin Clark score guys. Just so, you know, just so the league can take off better. It's like, that's just, it, it, it's just a clownish argument to make. You went viral this weekend, sis. I got to bring it up. You caught the L.A. Sparks game sitting right next to Kim K herself. What was that like? Was it too much? Was it too little? Talk to it, sis. Oh, man, it, it was very entertaining. Uh, and I guess in this age of where the WBA is, is, their popularity is being taken to another level. Now I see how many of my friends actually do watch the WBA because I was getting a lot of texts. I was uh, certainly people were tweeting about it. But I, I get to the Sparks game and um, they, by the way, they were playing out in Long Beach. Uh, you know, that was kind of they had made this room. Uh, apparent, they had made these decisions because they had to sort of factor in the Lakers might still be in the playoffs. Obviously, that didn't turn out to be true. And so uh, they hadn't moved the, the opener. So they're in a much smaller arena than they're normally used to playing in. And so when I get there, uh, the, the Sparks informed me that, uh, you know, they're like, yeah, you'll, you'll be courtside and 
Um, but it, you, you, you know, just so you know, you'll be sitting next to Kim Kardashian in North. I was like, wait, what? <laughs> I'm sorry. Okay, I've never met Kim Kardashian. I felt kind of bad because I've, I've never seen a single episode of Keeping Up with the Kardashians. Obviously, I know who she is. I mean, she's an international superstar. And um, never have I felt so homely in my whole life because Kim Kardashian came in there looking like she just stepped out of a runway and I looked like I had just finished my shopping at Ralph's, which I think I probably have, <laughs> but that's okay, <laughs> right? <laughs> and, but she, uh, we talked during the game. Um, she was very nice, very gracious. And if people haven't seen it, she's got an amazing campaign for her shapewear skims that involves a lot of WNBA players, Kelsey Plum, Candace Parker, um, you know, a lot of other notables um, that, that are in this ad campaign. And, it, it, and it's really wonderful. It went viral when the campaign came out. And so we, you know, we talked about that ad and she has a genuine appreciation, love, respect, uh, and knowledge of the WNBA. You know, we talked about the salaries and, and, and different stuff like that and different dynamics. And uh, yeah, she was, um, she was a, a, a wonderful seatmate, <laughs> if you will. And uh, yeah, but it, it was great to, to see her there to support because in this new age of WNBA fandom, People have been trying to accuse women of not supporting the WNBA, even though at most WNBAs I go, WNBA games I go to, the majority of the audience tends to be women. I certainly see some men there. But this idea that women aren't supporting the league, I thought was also a false narrative. But with somebody with her celebrity to get behind this team and to show such open support, um, I, I thought it was wonderful. The person I was really jealous of was North because North got to do everything. She got to toss T-shirts. She got to uh, dance uh, with the Sparks mascot. I mean, North had herself a time, and I was here for it. <laughs> it's Jamel Hill on YouTube. It was good to see her righteously pissed off. Just righteously. Righteously. Pissed, just, That's just pissed. Uh, Jamel, good talking to you. Uh, we'll talk to you again. I want to transition, Stugatz, from that to Dan Mullen at a pool party. What? Because that's right. Huh. Uh, Dan Mullen uh, is uh, in Vegas. This is a very huh. uh, Vegas pool party. I believe the best pool parties in America are in Vegas, right? It, uh, put it on the poll at Levitard. Not Th Starkville? Vegas or Miami. <laughs> the best pool parties in America at Levitard Show. Uh, what is Dan Mullen doing? Not recruiting. Not recruiting. Not recruiting. <laughs> well, I mean... Taking a video like you'd imagine Greg Cody would at a party, just kind of just like getting the landscape of the whole thing. Just like, hey, I'm at a party. Let he's me at, take my phone and go in a circle. He's at an Eric Prids pool party, too, which is like reputed to be one of the better deep house DJs out there. It's just, just I can't imagine someone that is at that pool party that just knows a little bit about college football and seeing Dan Mullen there, presumably in his visor, shirtless, filming the whole thing, <laughs> shirtless. If, if you watch it, if you see his like social media, like Dan Mullen isn't exactly who you might think he is. He has other interests. He's a big Wrexham guy. Oh. So, but when I initially saw this on my timeline, I thought, God, man, this has to be someone else that has just got a parody Dan Mullen account. I'm not sure who the person that wakes up and decides they're going to have a Dan Mullen parody account. But no, this is actually Dan Mullen who's just having a hell of a time at the Prids pool party. He's 52 years old. You Def know what the Yemen Mullen stands for? Midlife crisis. I mean, what oh. is he doing? Damn, it stands for my kind of guy. <laughs> it's a Vegas party at a pool party. You're going to shame him? What for else are you going to do in Vegas? I don't know. I mean, one thought would be maybe see the Aces play. And if you wanted to see the Aces play, ah, let me tell you, there is there a, Dan Mullen, if you're out there, what you could have done is you could have downloaded the Game Time app, created an account, and used the code Dan, that is D-A-N, for $20 off your first purchase terms apply, last-minute tickets. Uh, if – I love that. When I'm in a pinch and I realize, oh, the Aces are playing, I check the game time map. I see what my seat might look like in that arena. Maybe I'm not that familiar with it. I get a great customer service, a low price guarantee. So thank you so much, Game Time. We appreciate your support. Lowest price guarantee. That is promo code DAN for $20 off your first purchase. Stugatz, did you see, uh, I don't know whether you were following LSU baseball last year, <laughs> whether you're following Pirates baseball this year, uh, but there is a mustache that throws 101 miles an hour. It's just all mustache. Paul Skeens uh, started the game yesterday, struck out the first seven guys because it's all, here's 101, what are you going to do? <laughs> and the answer is nothing. You're just going to swing and miss. <laughs> 
<laughs> seven strikeouts to start the game. I think it was nine out of the first ten guys have no chance. And it's all coming from behind a giant mustache. What's going on with the mustaches in Major League I Baseball? I noticed that the other day, too. I've been watching with young people I've been, in general. Yeah, I've been yeah, watching yes. more baseball lately, and there are like some glorious mustaches. Not just like the freshly grown one just for S's and G's, like some really bushy, committed mustaches. A lot of Minshews, a lot of Striders. It's, it's just a lot of facial hair. Paul Skeens dating Libby Dunn. I just wonder how all of this hype for him makes baby Gronk feel after he rizzed her up. We're about to get to Shooter McGavin, Stugatz, because Happy Gilmore is having a remake, and Shooter McGavin, Christopher McDonald, is going to join us. Uh, you may see him in hacks these days. Uh, you'd recognize the face, certainly. He's going to join us here in a little bit. But I wanted, uh, before Are we get- a remake of Happy Gilmore or like a sequel? A sequel, excuse okay, me. Yeah. Uh, uh, a sequel. I'm yes. ready to say goodbye to those characters. Uh, mm. My fault. Uh, so I wanted to get to, before we get to what happened in NASCAR this weekend, Stugatz, I thought this was a curious uh, back and forth that happened on X, where- I see the clip for the first time of Michael Phelps breaking down on Meet the Press, talking about his many mental health struggles. And to be great at what it is that he did, Stugatz, being underwater, the, the maniacal loneliness that that requires, right. I would imagine, to be a mental health challenge for anybody. But Michael Phelps broke down talking about how he and Jay Glazer have similar experiences with ups and downs. And Jay Glazer has been very honest here about panic attacks and just some real dark mood swings where they evidently are sort of like sponsors for each other, where it took Michael Phelps a minute where he was struggling with the idea of whether he should reveal or not that Jay Glazer was his mental health buddy, and then he just did. But Ryan Leaf now comes after Jay Glazer in a way that I found a bit startling by writing, Glazer is a fraud when it comes to anything mental health or wellness related. He uses it, uses it for his benefit and really isn't invested in any of it unless it benefits him and his brand. Phelps is an inspiration, but it gives me pause that he muddies his mind with that con man. Now, I don't know what happened between Ryan Light, Leaf and Jay Glazer, but to react that way to Michael Phelps saying that he's got somebody who's a life preserver when he feels like he's drowning? That's a poison that Ryan Leaf has in him that's embedded deep when you can't hear an Olympic champion whose life has publicly been a struggle tell you there are times so despondent that if you've heard Jay Glazer talk about it on this show... You might be startled at the level of vulnerability that goes dark with Jay Glazer because he seems to be somebody who is deeply wounded at his core and doesn't mind asking for help. For him to be a source of inspiration and help to Michael Phelps and have Ryan Leaf react that way makes me have more questions than I have answers about what the hell happened there that would make anyone feel Jay Glazer is a con man when it comes to mental health, when he's clearly struggling with stuff, that he has developed himself a great deal of soothing for himself that he could talk about it in front of people because he's always been hiding it under whatever it is that he thought masculinity was. Anyways, awkward transition from there. I thought Mike was going to comment there. I'm sorry. I, I thought somebody something. was, right. but no, I guess sorry. I only turned my microphone on I because thought, of the I awkward thought, silence. Yeah. Well, but then I tried to, to realize, right. like, how do I make this about NASCAR? I'm and I quickly realized I can't. Right. <laughs> yeah. I was trying to think about where Glazer did Ryan Leaf wrong. Like, I'm just right. trying it's to think about. Probably one of Fox right. pregame shows. It had to be. Truth be told, I was not at all prepared for the gambit. And I had already, like, I told myself, I'm only doing, like, one mental health segment today. So right. I was just like, okay. The Happy Meal, yeah. I'm at the quota. <laughs> the Happy Meal, that's correct. We did four minutes on the Happy Meal, and that was Mike's quota for the day. <laughs> and so, no one else. I mean, they both have they all, they both have public personas, and I think Jay Glazer has, uh, has really bought a lot with it with the audience where Ryan Leaf has struggled plenty in the in the public I, that seems like a personal beef there that's con I don't know what's going on there speaking of personal beef Stan I don't know if you watched the NASCAR all-star race last night I did I watched it with the sound on which is one of the first times I've done that this Why? season because it was, it was I'm super into NASCAR right now it, okay. it, it percolated a little bit with me like during lockdown and stuff because I was just looking fiending for sports and now I finally get it I, I got it. I, I see the light. This is a great motorsport. 
I'm in on it. And I know that NASCAR fights, people sometimes question the authenticity. It goes along with the sport. It's not bad for the sport. This race, the all-star race, number one, very confusing. There's an open beforehand and then there's like an all-star race that's an exhibition. Doesn't count for points, but a million dollars is on the line. Don't get caught in the weeds. Keep it going. Get to the fight. I am. You interrupted me. How do you make the all-star game? Stop interrupting me. weird. Let them talk. There's there's points. I'm I'm not going to. That's going to be super confusing. (laughs) Logano leads like all the laps but one. Gets a million dollars. But in the first lap, Ricky Stenhouse gets pushed into the wall by Kyle Busch. And Kyle Busch, he DNFs, he, he goes into pit lane and he decides after that moment that he's going to park in Kyle Busch's uh, pit box and have a word with the crew chief. And the NASCAR commentary team pointed out that Stenhouse is kind of locked in here until the race finishes because there's no bridge outside. So he's just spending two hours stewing. He had changed out of his track suit into some shorts and he decided, you know what? I'm going to get me some. I've had two hours to concentrate on this. He had other interviews where he said, someone may have to hold my watch. So he goes right up to Kyle Busch. Kyle Busch is an agitator. And uh, a lot of people have an issue with Kyle Busch uh, in the NASCAR circuit. And he punches him in the face. He punches him in the face, and a brawl ensues. And part of the brawl, you see that Ricky Stenhouse Jr.'s dad gets punched in the face by Kyle Busch. Then there's an absolute unit of a track dude. This dude in a track suit cleans house and nobody <laughs> wants that. This dude's a total unit. But a here's a great dude. angle. I, at first I was like, ah, it's a fake punch. But this angle shows you that he, that Ricky Stenhouse wa- was feeling feisty and he connects with like the temple. He got a good shot in on Kyle Busch and it was a pretty good brawl. And I love that NASCAR is just like, yeah, I don't, I don't know if any fines will result of this. I, I don't know that much about the sport, but this was pretty much covered like it's a regular occurrence. We've all been there waiting two hours to punch somebody, and the rage doesn't subside. Yeah, can we show the unit one more time? <laughs> that can we, giant guy? Can we really show the, the one dude yes, that, that was, he did that was like, I don't care if this is right. staged or not. Right. Black and green tracksuit guy cleaned house and nobody – Nobody wanted any of that smoke. That giant unit of a man. Everybody has wanted to do this to Kyle Busch for a while, including this show. Yeah, where? Yeah, we, <laughs> yeah, we we're, I here's okay. Big unit coming in. Yeah, he's coming in he's hot. That's guy. that's yeah. Ricky Stenhouse Sr. fighting with Kyle Busch. He Ricky Stenhouse Sr. got clocked Here by Kyle Busch. Here comes Sasquatch. Here comes Here our he unit. Is. Yes, he's just clearing people out. He's yes, just- nobody. <laughs> Whoa, that is strength. And he's got the high ground, too. So everybody, he says clear out of the way. People clear out of the way. But this was a great moment, and there's so many great camera angles of this. Kyle Busch was followed by journalists, and there's actually beautiful cinematography for iPhone cameras. <laughs> yeah. there, there's one shot where wow. Kyle just approaches, but there's a great still from all this. There's a couple great stills. If we can fire up the still image of Kyle Busch approaching Ricky Senhouse, who is there waiting for him, casually with an arm up on the truck, ready to fight can i get that one image please and what's so cool about this is you got the ghost of the intimidator hanging over his shoulder you got the three the uh, the immortal three right behind ricky Stenhouse. what that that is a memeable photo that is a great photo shorts were a bad choice if you want to look tough for ricky Stenhouse. but yeah nascar is here i think it's having a moment and that's totally internalized because i'm just a, a nascar fan now but if you want something cool that isn't a fight and many of you don't Many of you, your affinity for NASCAR ends, it begins and ends with the NASCAR pit fight. I get that. It's not for everybody. But something unprecedented is happening Memorial Day weekend, this coming weekend. Kyle Larson, who I told you, it's not my take. What made me get really into this was Marty Smith Smith was Marty Smith telling me that Kyle Larson's the best driver on the planet, and that includes Max Verstappen. But what Kyle Larson did over the weekend was kind of prove Marty Smith right. Kyle Larson flew into this uh, this all-star race. He flew in from Indianapolis. Why? Because he was busy qualifying for the Indianapolis 500, and not just qualifying, like barely getting in. We've seen Tony Stewart do this before. We've seen Kurt Busch do this before. Kurt Busch, I think, I don't know how many times he even raced IndyCar, but he had like a 25th place finish. What Kyle Larson did was, as a rookie, he qualified fifth overall for the Indy 500. That's not what he drives. He is a NASCAR driver. In his first shot, he qualifies top five. And what he's going to do, 
this holiday weekend is something special. He's going to he is looking to be the first driver since Tony Stewart way back when to complete every mile of this double. He is racing the Indy 500 and he's racing a NASCAR race in Charlotte the very same day. Wow. And Kyle Larson actually has a shot and this would be mind-blowing a mind-blowing achievement if he does it in his debut at Indy to win it. But can you imagine if Kyle Larson strolls into that motorsport uh. and wins its most prestigious race. Chris Cody, do you have some sound of Kyle Busch hanging up on our show? What uh, What was the most memorable uh, brother fight that you guys had? You guys had to have good brother fights, no? Oh, yeah, yeah. There was definitely times where, uh, you know, it came down to maybe a little uh, throwing match or screaming match, whatever. But uh really can't remember the exact subject it might have been over. So, all in all, you know, it's just no different than any other brothers, I'd say. But, Kyle, you're always fighting. I am? You're not? Not that I know of. You haven't fought with a bunch of uh, people like Kevin Harvick and uh, that old guy that you fought, Childress? <laughs> yeah, all right. Well, just uh, keep bringing them up. Who else you got? Well, okay. No, that's my list. But it's a lot with Harvick. It's right. It's not It's not one or two with Harvick. It's a lot with Harvick. No? Uh, I don't know. All right, Kyle, good talking to you. We're done here. Thanks, buddy. Appreciate your time. Thank you, sir. He got the dealer clap. Man. Oh, yeah, the, the old landline. Uh, Patented. Stugatz has for us his top five classic uh, la NASCAR last names. But just real quick, I want to see that one angle again. When the punch connects, does spittle come out of the mouth of Kyle Busch? You guys tell me if there's spittle anywhere here. Oh, wow. A lot. A lot. It seemed like that that knocked the spit out of his mouth is what it looked Did like. Did he have a drink in his hand? Was that I all from his mouth? I, it, it looked play it like, again. We it, need to play it, it again. It looked like yeah. it was spittle. Uh, Stugatz, let's do your top five uh, classic NASCAR last names. Any OLIs here? Ah, yeah, I have four. Yep. Oh, it's a water. There's a water bottle in his yeah, hand. Yeah, it's a water bottle. Four OLIs? Yes. Juju yes. just whispered, Where are the fathers? He Rick got punched. I couldn't yeah. get my joke in because y'all talk so goddamn much. Jesus. Sorry, Juju. It's amazing. <laughs> You're just going to give him a joke. <laughs> Salute. I love you, Mike. Jarrett. He needs the fanfare, Chris. Keep up. Allison. Bush. Wallace. Number five, Unser. Number four, <laughs> Earnhardt. <laughs> Just keep it. Number, Number three, three. <laughs> Yarborough. Number two, Petty. Number one, Waltrip. Hey, what's up, Shooter? Well, I'm hanging in there. This Zoom stuff is really exciting. Oh, it is so nice to see you. Do you know, I know that you do this for everybody. He addressed him as shooter. I know. I mean. uh, it's Christopher McDonald, and he's done a lot of other things, although I don't know if people uh, connect with him as much as they do with the asshole Shooter McGavin. You played the so well. I mean, it, it, <laughs> it, in fact, it's rarely been played better than you. And I'm guessing that this reaction you're getting from us, you get all the time. People who are just delighted to see your face. They, well, delighted is interesting. They, they love to hate the shooter. I don't know why. Uh, I, I seem like a nice guy, but the character was so damn much fun to play. And the working opposite Sandler and having so many great actors in that show. I can't walk down the street without people just going, shoot. I don't even know if they know my name. They just go, shoot up, and they throw the guns up. It's pretty funny. <laughs> Can you explain to us what the connection is, how it resonates, why it resonates? Because I have you had another role that feels like that one where it connects with an entire generation? Uh, no, I'd have to say Happy Gilmore is the one that that uh, has been standing out. It's it's crazy. I was I was uh, I've been jerks before, <laughs> been jerks in Thelma and Louise, but she had to go over the cliff rather than come back to me. That wasn't good. So I knew I had to go out there a little bit. Uh, but this was just so much fun with sports talk and, you know, and and all the, the great lines they wrote and uh, we ad libbed. It was just uh, it's just it, people res it resonates and people love the Sandman. So everyone's watching this thing. I think they just threw it back on uh, after I made a little faux pas and said there might be a two coming around. Then uh, they uh, they stuck it on uh, Netflix and it was like the number one show for a long time. So that was great.
Do you understand? Like Eight years old. <laughs> do you understand the connection? Like, can you articulate to us how it is that a moment uh, you had no idea that that was going to connect there with so many people? Did you? No idea. No one ever knows. I think in a movie, you have you know, you take your odds, you take your shots at it, and then you get test audiences and stuff. And I remember people enjoying it a whole lot when I went to the premiere twenty eight years ago at, at uh, Universal. Uh, it was uh, very well received, but you never know. No one really laughed at the shooter so much, but they laughed at me for many, many years after. <laughs> what would you say is your breakout role? Is it Thelma and Louise? Yeah, well, Thelma and Louise was, you know, that was a game changer in a lot of ways. It blew the doors open for a lot of really cool directors to work with and uh, such a great story. And uh, it was never done before. And so many people turned it down in the business of show because they thought, Two broads, uh, you know, bankrupt. I don't know. I don't think no. And so Ridley Scott, God love him, uh, had the vision and just made it sound so great to the ladies and to to the cast and uh, one of the greatest directors I've ever worked with because he is your champion throughout. And that is a that is a gift for an actor. He just says, "You do you, man. You go and do it." And if he has any notes for it, he will give it to you. But he just he just sat back and <laughs> and laughed a lot at what I was doing. So. It's pretty I, funny. I should tell the people who's nominated for an Emmy for his role as Marty on HBO's Hacks. It's very funny. It's in season three, Thursday nights on Max. And last week's episode of Hacks was a golf episode. It aired the night after Netflix announced that a sequel to Happy Gilmore was in the works. Do you guys have for me the video of Christopher McDonald in a back and forth? I don't know what most people want to talk to him about or repeat to him, although he said, you know, they just say shooter. But let's have the back and forth. He was just such a great, pompous, rich uh, country club <laughs> golfer. He had the hair for it, the sweater, perfectly cast. No one else could play the role of shooter. Here's a back and forth with Adam Sandler. Big trouble, though, pal. I eat pieces of <laughs> like you for breakfast. You eat pieces of <laughs> for breakfast? No. <laughs> um, how much of this was ad libbed? How, how, how much? I use that once a week, by the way. <laughs> how, how, mu how much was scripted and how much was ad libbed? Everything was scripted up to the point where I said, uh, no. <laughs> they left it in, which I thought was quite uh, funny because Shooter had no comebacks at that time. He got better later on in the whole stuff. You know, quit fraternizing with the help. Gilmore just hit your ball if you can find it. Hi, Grandma. <laughs> <laughs> you know, stuff like that. Just, just too much fun to do. Were you around for the Bob Barker scene? Were you uh, in the presence of the Price is Right host when he fought Adam Sandler? That scene right there is arguably one of the most memorable. I was around. I was making a deal up on the hill with, uh, with the great late uh, uh, actor. And, and we had, uh, had such a fun time. And I stuck around to watch him do it. And the great thing about Bob Barker, God love him too, uh, it was the fact that he said, I'll do it. Well, I'd like to do my own, uh, my, my own stunts. I'm a bit of a pugilist. And he's like, it's <laughs> like this guy weird. Okay, Bob. And he did it and it was so funny. And then, you know, the price is wrong and all that stuff is just classic. All scripted or Barker, did he ad lib any of it? Did he throw in a bitch here and there that wasn't in the script? I think they added a bitch at the end. <laughs> price is wrong. And he walks away, comes back, bitch. <laughs> On Friday, you posted a pantheon of golfer mugshots. Uh, I'm not you... sure that's his Twitter no, account. No, I, I would actually like to ask, like, what are your thoughts on the parody account that has actually kind of helped the legend of Shooter McGavin grow? And I, I assume a lot of people assume, just like Sugats did, that you run admin on that account? You don't? Uh, that's a good question, and I just ran into him recently. I went to Cleveland. That's where I spilled the beans on the number two happening. All I did was see the, was the, the front page, but anyway... Uh, yeah, he's a good guy. He's very funny, but I asked him to leave this stuff out. But so I have to uh, call him and say, really? But, you know, 87 gajillion thousand views. So um, he's, he's joined the club. He's a funny guy. He's he gets, you know, it helps him out, helps his family out. They get, you know, they get uh, back. And and I, you know, I talk to him from time to time and say, hey, uh, let's do this or let's be, do that. And, and And he just takes it and runs with it. He's a pretty funny guy. So. I'm all for it. What can you tell us that people do not know about the shooting of Happy Gilmore? Any of the behind the scenes stuff? You had no idea. It it could have felt at times like you were making a really movie, right? This uh, it can be hard. This uh, this line between what it is you guys actually achieved, and sometimes that stuff swings and misses, and you have no idea whether it's actually going to work. 
Yeah, I think I think it was mostly a joyous experience. Uh, there was a little ad libbing and a little barb throwing and things like that. And first of all, I had no idea why they call him Shooter. And I thought, I know, I'll get off the tee. I thought, no, that's stupid. That's what Gilmore does. He hits it like a monster. I know, I'll I'll pull the guns out and I'll make this thing happen when I make putts or stuff like that. And that's what stuck. And I did ask Dennis Dugan, our great director, to say, uh, I said, Dennis, I know we're losing light and everything, but please ma- let me make this putt. Don't let it roll into the, the ball, roll into the cup. With the, no. Let me put it in the hole, put it in one shot. And he said, all right, McDonald, I'll give you, and I'll give you five tries. And I think that was try try number five because it lipped out and it was on a botanical garden because no self-respecting golf club is going to let you, you know, drop a tower on their, uh, on their greens. <laughs> So uh, we uh, we just basically <laughs> we did that and it went in and then I just added up like crazy. I went, you didn't but shoot that baby. <laughs> it was just too much funny. I did throw my putter too. I don't know. It could have hit somebody and hurt somebody, but I was just in the zone and then I I think I threw it over their head. Thank God. <laughs> Be- because the finger guns were so perfect at just giving off just total condescending arrogance uh what were the rejected things that you went to in the mirror before you chose the finger guns because i can't imagine anything coming close to the finger guns no i just think if if, it what there wasn't much of a other choice it was basically the finger guns or uh you know high sign i don't know uh (laughs) the fingers the fingers thing was shooter all the way and uh just to just to do that and pop it out each time and like that is just too funny. There, there are bobbleheads made of the of the arms going up and down. I like this now. <laughs> who is the stra- Who is the strangest or most unusual, uh, powerful person who has wanted to talk to you about that role where you've been taken aback? The strangest, powerful, most powerful person, uh, Rich Eisen. He's pretty powerful. Oh, I, mean, <laughs> I love him. He and Sandler are good That's... mates too. We just uh, we talk about. We kind of drop the idea that it might be happening, uh, you know. But this is this is many years later. I guess it's got to be in. The, I don't even know anything about the script to be honest. So, is it the senior tour? Is it the is it the Ryder Cup? I don't know what they're doing. But Tim Hurley and and Adam are working at it. So uh, we'll see what happens soon. But Rich Eisen, is, <laughs> he go, Adam said McDonald dropped the ball. What's up? He goes, could how could you think you could trust shooter? Come on, really. So, but it wasn't my fault. That's all I'm saying. Stugatz was disappointed. Rich Eisen, he wanted, there has to be he, someone bigger. He wanted he, someone better than Rich Eisen. He, Stugatz was palpably disappointed by I mean, that. I'm better than Rich Eisen. Come on. <laughs> come on. Just, I was just saying it. I mean. Come on. I mean, football podcast of the year, three years in a row. Uh, what details of the plot can Golf be? Clap. That's awesome. <laughs> thank, you. thank you. Thank you very much. Golf you know clap. what? No one else Respect. is happy for me around here except for you. I like you, man. <laughs> what? <laughs> last year. <laughs> what details right. of the next uh, Happy Gilmore script of the plot can you share with us? Anything? This much. Okay. Zero. <laughs> they a- tell me a- nothing. They know I have a. I have. I spilled the beans a little early, so they uh, they keep it away from me. I can't wait to read it. To be honest. Like I say, they're working at it right now, and uh, I know that Tim Hurley is da- was down at the uh, PGA. Oh, my God. What? What is that? Was that great golf or what? Uh, amazing. Yes. Was- yes. You want theater? Holland. Great golf. It was – it took my breath away. Shot after shot after shot. These guys are monster hitters and insane putters. It was just – if you didn't like golf after watching that, you don't you don't like the game of golf. So, you know so, what I'm I mean, you wanted to make your own putt, so it was clear that you liked golf before you got into Happy Gilmore. But since then, it seems like you have such a deep passion for the sport, and that's where I'm sure the access to a lot of powerful people has come in because they all love that movie too. And you've just been—it's almost as if you're you're considered a real golfer in golfer circles. It's <laughs> odd. It is odd. It is a. Uh, it is the most wonderful and frustrating and uh, mind blowing and exciting game. I've played a lot of sports in my day, but I didn't get into golf until later on in my you know, early twenties. So uh, it, it's it's a game I love to play. I mostly do it for charities. You know, it's great. We we raise a lot of money for St. Jude's with our friend Patrick Warburton. Uh, we you know helping kids out that are having a hard time in life. It'll, it, it's nothing better than to get together and do it for a great cause and raise a lot of money to s- save those things. But for the most part, it's just uh, I I get new clubs. I've got like I, I hate carrying my clubs because the original clubs were stolen off of a plane. I couldn't like, where's my clubs? They're not here. 
oh man so i got really bummed about that and then wilson is so nice enough to send me another set and then uh now i play with pxgs and i have callaways wow. up in the mountain you know it's it's good it's good stuff hmm. how under how underwhelming is your actual golf game for people <laughs> <laughs> what a question uh people ask me you you, you really golf shooter and i go i can play <laughs> I bet I, I bet you're good. Answer. I bet no, yeah. I bet you're good. And I bet you don't want to brag now, but I would love to make you our golf correspondent. If you just want Please. to analyze what happened this weekend, the genuine passion, the radiance that emanated from you talking about golf. Please, the stage is yours. Tell us everything that you loved about this weekend that included the world's number one golfer being arrested uh before a round and doing a stretching in jail. Yes, how insane was that? I, I I love the guy. He's fantastic. I was rooting for a lot of people on that. I, you know, and JT was had some insane shots. He was like he chipped out of I think three or four times. He chipped out of the sand. Unbelievable golf, um, and and put it in. <laughs> anyway, so um, the whole, yeah, the whole Shuffle thing was in, was uh, was terrible. I'm sure he'd like to relive that. And but you know, he had his own. I could see where he was going. It was kind of a shooter move to go right by the cops, wasn't it? Yeah, it was yeah, to drag yeah, the cops. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> it's, yeah, a total, yeah. it's a total like shooter a cop, move. That was uh, yeah. But um, I'm sure he'll he'll live it down. He, he he just it was just one of those moments where I got to get yeah. You know, so anyway, I don't want to like uh, get in trouble here, but uh, I love the guy. I love the top five six players that just came in. How about how about the Irishman that comes in and just kind of starts killing it yeah. on on Lowry. day three? Shane Lowry, yeah, from a bike. Lowry is unbelievable. Back. He's 25 years old or something. Like just boom, <laughs> boom, boom, and then putting in like crazy. I was just most impressed. That was uh, that was magical. I sat there and I watched it going. Oh my God, this is the most insane golf. And I, I got to say, I, I, my, my boy is Rory. I wanted him to get the, up there a little higher. He, he got really close. I think it was 11 the last time I saw him. And it, you know, it's hard. The game is hard. That's all there is to it. It takes, it takes a lot of luck, a lot of good little hops, a lot of good breaks. And uh, we, we saw the whole gamut of that in this uh, U.S. Open. It was just brilliant. Brilliant, brilliant golf. Before we let you go here, and I will remind the people, Hack Season 3 is streaming on Max now. Uh, the interactions that you have had with professional golfers that come to mind when you think of them wanting to interact with you because your character has become something of a golf icon? Uh, yeah, I actually do some work with some of them. I, I work with uh, the uh, PGA Tour 2K and uh, uh, Colin Morikawa is a friend and he's just a great guy and man did he have a round uh, uh, well he had four rounds that were amazing um, uh, Mr. Finau is an amazing guy he, he get up to the tee and I got I was announcing at the tee that time it was a Houston Open and uh, just one of the great guys and he starts to do his do his lineup and on the tee <laughs> this Finau and then he comes out and does the whole Adam Adam Sandler you know happy Gilmore dance where he's going to go up and spack it. It was so funny. Crowd loved it. Uh, we just have a lot, a lot of fun together and uh, uh, they're, they're just great normal guys. And of course, Tiger, I got to interview him. I got to down, go down to medalist at his home course and one of the nicest guys in the world. We had a blast together and, uh, and it's, it's thanks to, to the company P, uh, PGA tour 2k is they just, uh, they're just killing it. And uh, I, I love to be a part of it. So uh, I just got that that thing done where you stand around and get all your things, whether you're adding me to the game, so you can play a shooter. Oh my god! <laughs> Those names, by the way, all bigger than Rich Eisen. Christopher, <laughs> it is good. It is good seeing you. Uh, thank you. And uh, just last question on your way out the door: How soon into filming did Sandler choose that as his golf swing off the tee? Was that immediate? <laughs> like, was the whole movie built around just that? You saw his very first scene when he knocks the neighbor off. Yeah, that was day one. So he knew what he was doing. He based it on a friend, I think, from uh, high school who was a great hockey player. I mean, a terrible hockey player, but a great stick as far as could whack the ball. And that's how, how the whole happy Gilmore character came along. So he he was working on it for a long time. And he's very good at it. He actually really can, can you know, send it out there. So that's when he challenged me back in the, other, back in the day. And I, and I said... Putting for the dough, which was really funny. That went kind of crazy viral, too.
Are you in with being our golf correspondent? Because an Irishman who's putting very well is perfect. That's what we need. Okay? That is what we need. Yes. We, we do <laughs> exactly. need that kind of expertise after all the majors. There's no truth to the rumor that uh, you're actually going to play in one of these the matches, right? Because that was a hot little internet rumor for a while that you'd be paired with a PGA pro and Sandler would be paid, uh, paired with a PGA pro for charity. Yeah, I heard that it was going to happen, but I just think it's a lot of, you know, rah, rah, rah. so... I don't know. I, I, I know they sometimes that stuff just shows up and people make, yeah, I'm going to play with uh, Mickelson and he's going to play with Tiger and it's, it's on. Not so much. Christopher, good seeing you. <laughs> Thank you for making the time, sir. We appreciate your work. Thanks for having me. It's a joy to be here. Keep on keeping on, boys. Thank you, sir. Shoot up. <laughs> if you want to just hang around, if you just want to linger around our show, just uh, wander over whenever you want. I'm going to start the whole thing over again. <laughs> Thank you, guys. Again, appreciate you. See you later. Golf correspondent. See you later. I can't. Uh, we can't. Whoa, do whoa at the end there. That. Jeez. We can't do better. He, like than his that. laptop closing. He was taking us on a trip there. I didn't know where we were going. Yeah. He uh, he lingered for a long time, and I was happy to have him. Uh, were you he guys... just didn't know what he was doing. That's correct. Uh, would you guys, uh, did you guys get as happy, made happy by that as I was? Yes. Just, I don't know. Uh, Stugatz was asking and didn't want to. Whoa, whoa, whoa. No, no. He wanted to bring it up tomorrow for Cody, but I'm going to bring it up now. You were just talking about, I. he does a lot of other roles. I can't associate him, though, with a close second place on that role. Yeah, I'm okay with you announcing what it is I told you. I'm just not certain he knows how to get out of Zoom, so we might still be there well, in it's some a, way, it's shape, a, or it's form. A, it's right? a one-character Hall of Famer is what Stugatz was saying, yes. where you can associate somebody with other roles. I love him in Hacks. I do. I've enjoyed the first two seasons of Hacks. Mike Schur uh, was involved with that, and it's a, it's a very good show on Max. But I only associate him with Shooter. That's, I, can't, I can't see anybody else, and I'm not sure... How many movies are like that? I would assume comedies are better at producing that kind of character than anybody and, and than any of the genres. And specifically, I would say the asshole, the 90s asshole or the or the 80s asshole. Just somebody who are the most memorable assholes in the history of film. Of comedy. Of, wow. I mean, Brad, Bradley Cooper made a really nice career for himself after playing an asshole in Wedding Crashers. And whoever the guy who played Biff, who asshole. Yeah. Yeah. Yes. Nice little career too. Like I guess key to being an asshole is like a sweater around your shoulders. Yes. Is, is this how, thing how much of an asshole does that make you? Stan Gabriel, Revenge of the Nerds. Uh, Ted McKinley. But aren't we yes. playing you think of this person as that one role cuz Bradley Cooper I think of other roles now. Well, uh, he did get his start with that jerk role. Yeah. But what no, about he, Stifler? Sean William Scott. That's an excellent nominee. Yep. I'd go a different Damn. sort of character. Role models file. Uh, Jeremy Piven's entourage agent character is a different kind of asshole, not the same kind of asshole we're talking about, which is like kind of the universal high school asshole. And a great comparison, because Christopher McDonald's had a great career, illustrious, a ton of roles. Jeremy Piven, a ton of roles, a ton of memorable roles, but the one role is just so head and shoulders what he's associated with. He made that show. That show wasn't that good. That character, based on a real Hollywood yeah. agent, over the top asshole. It was very much of a show. time. I've I've done like occasional. I see clips pop up on my timeline, and I it see can't like hold an episode. Up. I'm like, oh, no. wow. I it's used cringe. to be like Sunday nights. I used to be about this. Hey, so Ralph. Bad. Ralph Fiennes, whoever plays Voldemort, asshole forever. Oh, the best. He had a Ray Fiennes. Okay. The English patient would like a word. <laughs> Ray Fiennes is not in this discussion. He is a thespian. I don't believe that... Uh, Schindler's List. Like He's known for a lot. Uh, Shooter McGavin. I, I, maybe he'd be insulted by this. I don't mean it as an insult. He would be. Uh, a thespian? Like, he's a good actor. He's indisputably a good actor. But this one role... And Adam Sandler movies in general don't give off thespian, even though I would say that Adam Sandler is a good actor. I would absolutely say that. And I don't think uh, I think most people would treat him as a, a punchline. But I can't watch uh, Punch Drunk Love, which is a legitimately great movie, and uh, see him as anything other than a great actor. Juju, what did we get uh, right today? What did we get wrong? What did we not cover enough 
totally different when, when I'm here. Uh, the guy who played uh, Home Alone, the big brother in Home Alone, he's an asshole as well. Yep. Oh, yeah, um, yeah, yeah. Also the good, uh, the stepbrother. Mm. I think we did a great job. We didn't, we didn't necessarily cover too much of Luca and the uh, yeah. heroism that it takes uh, for that team to get past the Thunder. But I think we did a phenomenal job. We got to the NASCAR a bit late, though. That was <laughs> a little late, if you ask me, but supreme job by us. Uh, supreme job. Why is it different when you're in person and everyone's around? Do I need to kick everyone out of the room so we can speak more honestly? As a matter of fact, I, we did have a the biggest flub. Uh, speaking of flubber, uh, uh, Shooter McGavin. That was a great movie by him as well. Yeah. Okay. <laughs> Happy birthday to Christopher oh, Jeff. Wow. Hey. Oh, yeah. Hey. Hold on a second. Hey. To okay. him. Yeah. I don't care. Good luck. Man, Happy he was, he he had a, some kind of face. On when you started with the flubber mention, yeah, I was like, "Come on, damn it!" It was funny though. Monday birthdays, huh? Eh, yeah, not yeah, great. Yeah. Celebrated. You yeah. celebrated yesterday, though. Let's be honest, we all celebrated on Friday. <laughs> what age? What Sucky age? Ass birthday. Birthday. The it's worst. I would argue that I am celebrating. If we ranked the first hundred birthdays of one's life, I would I would argue thirty seven has got to be bottom five birthday. Just in terms of relevance. Do you want to rank them? One to I'll do that for tomorrow. I'll rank all 100 Excellent. birthdays. No, right. actually, I'm going to give you a second, and you're going to do it oh. now. Oh, okay. Uh, 43 yes, is better than 37? Yes, just uh, top 10 uh, birth, worst birthdays. Uh, top 10 worst birthdays. And I've got to castigate uh, Stugatz on something. What? And, and the group. And it's an omission by Juju in what's supposed to be a correction segment. Hmm. An atrocity. That the Andretti's didn't make oh my your God. list of top five uh, names in racing, you or know, OLIs that the Andretti's well, didn't make anything in the top nine for you. I did say NASCAR; they're more indie drivers, so that's. But I'm upset about it, and I will be upset about it the entire day. How yes. how do the Andretti's, as a family You're and right. just a funny right. name, yep. not get into your top racing last names of all time? It's a bad job by me. An egregious yep. omission. Mm -hmm. Chris, Age eight is really not official. Not great. No. Not great birthday. So you guys think 37? I think 37 is a, I mean, it's not a great birthday because it's just a random number, but I think I'd long to be 37. I remember that Come as on. a, I, I, I remember that as a greater long time. To be 47. Than, uh, I have the top, I have the top five worst, no, not worst, just top five useless birthdays that you don't have anything, any, any, any use for. Okay. Any OLIs or we're going straight no, to No, we'll just go number five. Number oh, five. Yeah. 22. Oh. It's like the year after the big one. It's right. just like, what? Is this? Yeah. Nothing changes. Trying to repeat, right? Number four, 33. Ooh. These are too young. These are great years. What are you talking about? No, because once you get into the 50s and 60s, you're kind of celebrating. Like, you're just happy. No, to, oh, my God, not. I made it. No, yeah. you're not. So here. Dan and I are yearning no, for her not. 33rd birthday. No, you're not. I <laughs> talked to somebody the other day and forgot whether I was 55 or 56. Oh, wow. That happens to me. Wow. First time that happens to me. <laughs> Number three, 37. <laughs> Number two, 56, actually, Dan. <laughs> and number one, the most useless birthday, 11. <laughs> I think we can all agree on that. For sure. <laughs> useless. One. Nobody answered my question on which duo you want more. <laughs>